The scientific revolution starts now. The last time we talked to you, you were bouncing around between Thailand and Australia. Now you're in Amsterdam and Budapest, and you're working at this new foundation, and you seem like you have really reinvigorated the way that you're focused on economics and the future. And so I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about where you've been and what you're working on. Okay, well, the move down to Australia was because I was approached by a new Australian political party at the time called the New Liberals. And uh, liberal, by the way, in Australia means conservative. It's quite strange. Uh, but they, so they're going to go back to what the liberals used to be, which was a broad church and, and uh, sort of egalitarian and party informed by modern monetary theory. So I thought, well, they asked me to run as the Senate candidate. And I thought, well, I'm trying to get this stuff in front of politicians. Maybe it'd be more effective if I became one. But unfortunately, it was a complete flop. So I got... I came last out of the field of 20 candidates for the, um, I think, six positions that were available, and the lead candidate for the party, who thought he'd get more than 10% of the vote in the regional election he was running in, a seat called North Sydney, he got less than 1%, so it was a complete flop. And that then that was my first and last attempt at politics. So I moved back to Thailand, uh, which is where I'm building a house for my extended family there. Uh, but I also... Uh, I moved back to Amsterdam to sell a place in Amsterdam to buy a place in, in Bangkok. Then I got the offer for the centre I'm now at, which is called the Budapest Centre for Long-Term Stability. If anybody wants to look it up, it's BC, the number four, ls.com. And they offered me a research position here, quite well funded, um, to work on long-term sustainability issues. And, uh, and basically, it was an offer too good to refuse. It didn't involve a horse's head in my bed, if you know your... Uh, your mafia movies. Um, and uh, so I've got six months here to work on one book, half of which I've already written, with the title of, of Rebuilding Economics from the Top Down, mm. and uh, and two blog posts. And one of them is going to be um, taking a look at real-world firms, not the fairy stories, and that's being polite, that economists teach in their textbooks about firms' competition and you know, using you know, saying you maximise profits by equating marginal cost and marginal revenue. Those are completely foreign terms to real companies. Uh, real companies don't have anything like the, the preconditions for that model to work. And I've just gone through proving that the sensible thing for a real world corporation to do is to flog as many units as possible, which is what they do. So, um, and the other one will be, I think most likely I'll, I'll take another good look at the uh, absolutely appalling work that a conventional economist had done on climate change. Uh, and that the, that was another thing which has brought me back to Europe. I was approached by a, comp uh, by a not, for, not for profit in the finance sector called Carbon Tracker. And they'd seen my paper on the dreadful work that economists had done on climate change. And they asked me to write a report for them uh, with the advantage that they have thousands of subscribers who are pension funds and councils and anybody you who know, has a fiduciary duty towards their uh, clients. Um, and they've been trusting what, are, what consultants have been telling them about climate change, and the consultants have trusted what they've read from the economists, and what the economists have written is putrid nonsense, uh, which drastically underestimates the dangers we face, and therefore, of course, pensioners have been told, your pension is quite safe. My own pension fund told me, in you know, a letter that they sent out to all their uh, members, that a 4.3 degree rise in temperature by 2100 is an acceptable risk for my portfolio. At 4.3 to 3 degrees rising, uh, sensible scientists would argue that we'd be lucky to have between half a billion and one billion humans surviving the calamities that would come our way. So uh, that report's been published. It's had quite an impact. And I've been invited already. I've spoken at the uh, Bank of England about it. And I've spoken to parliamentary staffers in the UK. And it's been raised in the House of Parliament in the UK. So... Um, I've been fairly busy. Before we dig into the climate tracker stuff, uh, what was running for office like? Ugh, dreadful. <laughs> Why? I mean, for a start, well, two, one of the main reasons is that there, there are, the Australian Parliament is actually pretty well organised, certainly better than the American House of Cards. 
Um, but we so we have a, a lower house called the House of Representatives, which is based which is uh, based on you know regional. You, know, you you have your own little electorate, and we have rules that prevent gerrymanders. The American, if you know the American political system, the politicians choose the boundaries at the state level. So you get that's where the word gerrymander came from. Whoever it was, some politician called Jerry, who Jerry something, whose electorate looked like the shape of a salamander which is the way he made sure he stayed in power. Well, that's illegal in Australia. We actually have bureaucrats who decide what the boundaries are. There's a minimum variation, maximum variation of 20% around a mean for any electorate. So no electorate can be more than 40% larger than any other electorate, mm. which stops that sort of thing. Uh, but if we're running in the Senate, there are, we have six, 12 senators per state, and there are half of them are elected every three years. So you've got to get effectively 17% of the vote to get a quota and get elected that way. But in that case, you have 5 million people in New South Wales that I had to campaign in front of. Well, you simply can't do that unless you have money for advertising. We didn't have any money. So the the uh, House of Representatives campaigns, particularly in North Sydney, had a lot of volunteers and door knocking and handing out leaflets and so on. But that failed anyway. But mine, I just couldn't do anything, couldn't get much media coverage. So was quite a frustrating experience. And what was your platform? Sorry, pardon me. I said, what was your what was your platform? What were you running on the basis of? Well, um, I don't think I've ever seen an economist happened. running for office. I, there's like there a, a, appointed there economists. A, uh, a few a few economists have turned into politicians, so it's not un, not unheard of. Uh, I basically, I mean. We have politicians making decisions on climate change and making decisions on monetary policy, but they know bugger all about both. I know a hell of a lot about both. So I thought, you know, if I'm, I'm trying to get my knowledge about climate change and the ridiculous way in which economists like William Nordhaus in particular have drastically underestimated the dangers we face. And politicians have trusted them because they think they're experts. I know they're effectively they're morons on this topic, idiots, savants. They can do mathematical model of it, of it and they feed nonsense numbers in they've made up themselves and politicians are taking this seriously. So I was hoping to get the chance to make my maiden speech in Parliament, which is what, you know, that your very first speech is called a maiden speech in the Australian, I think, under the UK system. And I would have said, this is the real, this is what you're trusting from economists. And I would have been able to blast them uh, with the real information about what's going on with climate change. Uh, but that wasn't to be. So, uh, you know, one of those things, like, uh, there, there was a great, you know, you know the Australian humorist called Barry Humphreys, mm -mm. who died recently? He used to perform a, he had a major role called Dame Edna Everidge, cross-dressing and playing this weird suburban housewife who was uh, became a superstar. And one of his shows was called, At Least You Can Say You've Seen It. Well, at least I can say I tried. I mean, it's a hard road to hoe. I've I've really started to believe that politics without money is an impossible. It is. Goal. Yeah, that's corporate I mean, money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we 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 tried to raise money through crowdfunding. We got a trivial amount of money, enough to pay for the registration costs, but not much more than that. Um, and this is one of the great disappointments that you would hope. Like, if I'd done it fifteen years ago, I had a much larger profile in Australia back then. Uh, and maybe back then I would have got enough money to make it possible to make a stand, but that wasn't what I was trying to do then. I've been away. I, I left Australia in 2014. So I've, this is eight years later that I'm back in the country giving it a try. And I think I just I basically, you know, passed off the radar. And then without money, you can't. And, you know, the old saying from uh, uh, the movie, Oh, Lucky Man, money buys you justice. Well, it also buys you political exposure. And uh, I, I would prefer to see two things change about that. One, I'd like to see political parties getting funding only from the public purse, so no private donations anymore, and and uh, and therefore getting money proportional to their share of the previous vote, and then new parties getting a seed grant so they can at least make some sort of presence. But I'd also like to get rid of elections altogether because uh, it was, it, I think it was from, what was it called, the uh, dirty dancing? So if you vote, where, whichever way you vote, a politician still wins. And what you get is basically narcissists. And I know quite a few of the members of the Australian Parliament. They were students at the same time I was a student at Sydney University. And they've got serious cases of narcissistic personality disorder. 
That's why they run for office in the first place. I think you got a guy called Donald Trump who's a bit like that. Correct? Never heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've, I've saw with the, the 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 if you look back at the original it's democracy, the, the Athenians. Joke. Yeah. If you look back at the original democracy, which was the Athenian, um, of course slaves weren't allowed to vote. But there wasn't voting. There was a whole complicated system where the, the major families were asked to nominate people, then they'd nominate people, and then the people they nominated would nominate people, and on it went, and on it went, on it went. It was actually like a random number generator uh, with some quality control built in, in terms of, you know, level of education to some extent, but mainly it was what's called sortition. So you finally ended up with a, with a parliament which is representative in the genuine sense of the population that was allowed to vote. Whereas here, what you get is narcissists who claim they're representing you, but they're really representing themselves. So I, I think the whole idea of democracy is flawed, particularly American democracy, which is one of the greatest circuses on the planet. Uh, so well, they're, they're representing the themselves in the short term, too. That's what's really troubling about it is that there's like a four year yeah. plan for the country, right? It's just this, uh, uh, you never really get a, we don't have this future orientation as a nation because it's changing every few years and it doesn't seem like there's yeah. any systematic way to imagine a big plan. And I feel like this is something that actually uh, China has nailed down because you think, look at their policies and they're, they're projecting out a century from now and they have the ability to look at that. I mean, I'm, I'm not advocating that we turn into China or anything, but they don't seem to suffer from this same short-term vision. But I think that you've just uh, outlined uh, yeah. um, perhaps why Steve doesn't have faith in democracy, because if you leave it up to people what they want to do, people tend to want the things that will benefit them in the short run. But China doesn't leave it up to the people and just kind of makes these decisions because it can think of the destiny of empire or whatever in a way that democracy can't. Absolutely. You've all got, they've got other, I mean, the, the, the real strength of the Communist Party in China is that it's so huge. I was there back in 80, um, 81, 82. And at that stage, there were 30 million members in a population of a, a billion people. Now, that had the oppressive side that one in every 30 people you spoke to could be an informant against you. That's where the oppression comes from. But with that larger base, the main way you got promotion, of course, there's plenty of Machiavellian stuff going on inside as well, but it offers your skill in engineering that mattered. So a lot of the Communist Party officials I met were highly qualified engineers. And they, are, you know, they're not going to make stupid decisions like somebody who's done a degree in law or economics would end up doing. And um, so, the, again, it's, 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 a, it's a flawed, but to some extent, a version of a sortition system. But their power is too great and you can't get rid of them. Whereas the sortition system that the Athenians had, uh, you lasted. I don't know how many years it lasted for, but, you, you know, you were there and then your term ended. And I would supplement that with people who were genuine experts in their areas also having a role. And I'd have system dynamic software to enable them to model what they proposed at various times to see what the consequences were. Not that you can necessarily see the future entirely with a model, but without it, you, you know, you're in, you're in the dark, relatively speaking. And the issues we're dealing with now are so much more complex than any previous governments had to cope with uh, because we're really playing with the whole global climate system, uh, the, everything. And we really need to know what the what the impacts of our decisions are on that. And the people who are making the decisions right now haven't got a bloody clue. Um, so we, we need a huge reform of politics. Well, I mean, I think that we're dealing with a unique system in all of history in that the countries are networked together without the disadvantage of time, right? Because when you had uh, voyages across the ocean taking months because... Shiloh doesn't like where my microphone is. Is that better? Yeah. I just, I find the warmth of my breath on the microphone soothing and comforting. But so, uh, uh, what I was saying is that you had a time where there was colonialism and so, you know, England had colonies all over the world, but it would take forever to get from India to England because you'd have to go all the way around the Horn of Africa. Mm. But now you have trade routes that are so efficient and communication is so fast that, and the country is so independent from one another that you have a massive difficulty in networking all of these interests together and you are required to do it because 
the technology is such that you you can't get away from it. And I feel like that's it's the a, novel problem. That's that's a huge problem, I agree, because, I mean, the scale of our population is, well, 8 billion people, um, you know, and and, uh, and all the rivalries that exist, you know, nations the size of America, 350 million, 1.4 billion in China, 1.2 billion in India, 455 at a million in Europe. Um, it, it's it's and then the thing is we're forgetting that there are a few other billions on this planet as well called animals, which we try to pretend that we're not. Uh, we we don't take any account of their needs. We're destroying their numbers at the same time as we're promoting our own. Um, so that's why I, I, that's why I think we need to uh, we're going to be forced to whether whether we do anything constructive about it. Another is another story. But if we really are the most intelligent creatures on the planet then we should see our role as maintaining life on the planet. And that is a huge reorientation away from bickering about our own political and national interests. Hmm. Yeah, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on how to incentivize that kind of behavior because you talked uh, before we started about the, what did you say, the custodian, uh, looking at humans as custodians of nature, or as custodians of the, the earth and this enormous interconnected ecosystem. How can that be built into the incentive structures, the economic incentive structures that power the world? I, I think it has to start with education, frankly. We've, we've denigrated education very, very badly. Um, and education, the, 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 becoming a teacher is something you do if you can't find anything else to do these days. We really need to regard teachers as people who pass on the history of our, our civilization, the history of our species. And a role on the planet. So teachers have to get the sort of pay rates that currently people working in the finance sector get. In other words, they've got to be swapped. You know, finance sector we can do without, but teachers we can't when we pay them the wrong way around. So that would be a huge part of it. And then a huge part of the education was getting children to respect, to realise and respect the complexity and fragility of life. I think that's huge. Uh, then in terms of the type of economic system we'd have, we can't have the unidimensional system of mon monetary system. Everything comes down to, you know, how many pieces of green paper do you have fundamentally? And how can you get more pieces of green paper? Um, and how can you hide the pieces of green paper you've got from other people so they don't know you've got as many as you really have? <laughs> I mean, um, you, you, you have to meet somebody in the old uber wealthy, and I've met a couple, to get some idea of the level of wealth that they have. And people, people's attitude about income distribution and wealth distribution really reflects who they know, you know, and they really don't see, like they're seeing a tiny, tiny fraction of this enormous curve. Well, I've met people who own two. Apologies for the interruption, but we need your help. The Demystify Sci podcast is supported pretty much exclusively by viewers like you. So if you have a couple of extra dollars a month and you want to support the project, head over to patreon.com slash demystify sci. By supporting us with a monthly donation, you get access to both of the week's episodes early, you get to join our absolutely fantastic weekly patron chat, and you have our eternal gratitude, and you have made the world better by putting your money where your mouth is and supporting a valuable info structure that tries to make the world a better place. If you don't have any cash right now, you can support the project in any number of ways. You can join us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Discord. You can leave a comment on YouTube, you can subscribe, or you can take your friend's phone, the one that you think would be most interested in the podcast, find our most conventional episode, and subscribe them to the show. New people are how we grow, and they are how we attract better and better guests. Additionally, you can mark your calendars for April of next year when we are going to have our very first Demystify Sci conference. Otherwise, there's one more thing you can do, which is that if you want to volunteer to help us with the project, reach out. You can email us at demystifysci at gmail.com, and we would absolutely love to have you on board. In the meantime, back to Steve Keen. Estates in the one, one city, one with a helicopter pad and the other is being a, a mountain. This guy is reshaping uh, to make it just look just the way he wants for his uh, palatial uh, abode there. Uh, I've met another guy who was the model for Kingsman uh, who has two yachts. The small one's 80 foot, the other big one's 120 foot and has its own gravy band piano on side. The scale of wealth and inequality is huge. And it's all because there's just a single dimension of everything we do with money. So one thing that I've come up as a proposal to try to address carbon, uh, the, the amount of carbon we're pumping into the planet um, very directly could be generalised to other elements of the biosphere as well. And that's the idea of tradable carbon credits, that we'd have a two uh, monetary system, money as we currently have, 
which you earn as we do in a capitalist economy, workers, capitalists and bankers and all that sort of jazz. But the other would be uh, everybody every day or every week would get an account replenished with what we call tradable carbon credits. And they would be needed to buy the carbon content of anything you bought, whatever it might be. And that would be distributed on a national basis at the per capita level of that country. There's no chance of getting one for a global system. So every American will get the average amount that America consumes per head of carbon on a daily basis over a year. And the, because the income distribution is so incredibly skewed, that would mean that 90 to 95% of the population would end up each day with excess uh, carbon credits. Whereas the top five, one, one to 5% would run out before they had breakfast, probably before they got out of bed, uh, given the, the wealth uh, they currently consume. So they'd have to buy them off the poor. And you'd have a market where tradable carbon credits were purchased by the rich from the poor. And it would be an income redistribution system from the rich to the poor. It'd be a market mechanism, which neoclassical economists bullshit that they're interested in, but they try to say what the price of carbon could be using their own ludicrously bad estimates. This would be the market would choose the price. And it would put immense pressure to reduce the amount of carbon because the wealthy don't want to lose their money paying carbon. So they'd be a strong incentive to reduce their carbon load themselves, a strong incentive to innovate technologies that don't use as much carbon. And you every year you you go use the average and the average would be hopefully plunging very rapidly. So it'd be a way to mean that we stop pumping carbon dioxide into the biosphere at the rate we currently are. Now, you could generalise that to have it about biodiversity, have it about plastics and so on. We don't have to have a single dimensional money system now. That's one of the advantages of our computer technology. So if we did that, we'd have a, potentially a way that would say, OK, here's the incentives. And these incentives are shaped in such a fashion that your behaviour as much as possible is designed to support life rather than to exploit it. What keeps the uber wealthy from just buying their way into having enough carbon credits to maintain their standard of living exactly as it is right now? For a start, you could make them decay. Uh, there's the, the, uh, the idea that Silvio Gazel had about a monetary system back in, the, uh, in, in Argentina, it was adopted by the German, the Austrian town of Wargel during the Great Depression, and the, the use of script, which was issued by the local council, which depreciated if you didn't use it. So the same sort of thing today, again, this is all relatively straightforward to set up with modern computer technology, uh, and that would be a, a way of uh, making sure you couldn't accumulate huge amounts of this stuff and then evade the system. And also, if it was done on a national level, every nation, but every nation did it, there'd be no point of Jeff Bezos taking off here to Laos to get away from it, because as soon as he landed in Laos, he'd be by far the wealthiest person in Laos, and he'd have to buy it off the other Laotians. So it'd be a, it, it's a mechanism that I think, if it was done properly, uh, could not be evaded, whereas, of course, the rich can evade income tax and wealth tax and everything else till the cows come home. So that's one but of the great think, weaknesses. Do you think it's realistic now. to imagine a policy that the uber-wealthy would vote against? I mean, nobody in the uber-wealthy would... I, I just have a sense that the people at the top are the ones who really ultimately control which politicians sit where they sit. And so I, I don't... It's a beautiful idea that we could have some parallel incentive structure to money, but what is that even possible in the way that power is handed down? Probably not. Okay, I mean, I'm, I put I put forward ideas all the time that a hypothetical is these which could improve the system that I'm almost certain will never be implemented. So back before the global financial crisis, I argued for a modern debt jubilee. And that was a similar idea in some ways. It was saying we want to reduce the level of private debt. That's the real worry, not public debt. It's bullshit to worry about public debt. It's people worry about public debt don't understand the monetary system, and that involves almost the entire profession of economics. Um, but uh, the idea of a modern debt jubilee was to give everybody an equal amount of money, which they would be required to use to pay their debt down. And if they didn't have debt, then they'd get a cash injection, which you could either let them spend or they'd be required to buy a bond, something of that nature. So a similar sort of mechanism. I knew it had Buckley's chance. This is an Australian expression for no chance whatsoever. Buckley's chance of being implemented. But you had to put it forward. And so I feel the same way about this idea of a tradable carbon credit. The one difference being that at some point, and this 2023 is shaping up for a pretty interesting year, we're going to end up being so terrified by what we face in terms of climatic disturbances 
that even the wealthy might think, holy shit, we've got to do something or we're going to be wiped out. So I, I don't think it'll happen. But what, what if it was brought in, I think it used to be using the idea of a central bank digital currency. Uh, if it was brought in in that fashion, then it could ultimately be a system for rationing. And I think we're going to be forced to ration consumption. Uh, one, if we're going to hold our societies together, we can't let the price system decide who gets to eat you know, when climate really, breakdown starts to occur. It's really interesting because I, I think about the highway system by my parents' house. So the Bay Area was one of the first places that I saw in America to adopt high occupancy vehicle lanes. So you had a carpool lane and you can drive during traffic if you had more than two people in that lane. And as uh. they've digitized the tolling systems for the roads... Well, it was. it's important to mention that it was initially promoted as an environmentalistic... Yeah, idea. of course. Yeah, you instead of dri two people driving two cars, you drive in one car. It's fantastic, and you get rewarded because you get to go around traffic. And as they've digitized all of the roads, they've put in this fast track system. And now you must pay into the fast track system in order to use the lane. So you pay to use the lane no matter what. And number two, if you only have one person in the car, you can just pay a little extra to use the lane. Uh -huh. And so yeah, it's I mean, just it's this loopholes. gradual creep. And that's the thing. Like, these people are so good at making up loopholes. And Yeah, uh, well, I mean, like, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, there was a, one of my favorite books ever was a book by a guy called D.G. E. Hall called The History of South Asia. It really gave me an incredible insight into the politics and history and culture of all of the countries of South Asia. And he spoke about the, the Dutch and Indonesia and said the history of the Dutch in Indonesia is bringing in a set of schemes which are designed to benefit the Indonesians, and would then it turn to really exploit them for the benefit of the Dutch. So that it, that happens almost all the time. And again, this comes down to our politics. You get the, We've got the best politicians money can buy. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. That's the whole thing where this is based on narcissists being paid by and financed by, uh, you know, ideologues and and. And, and financially wealthy individuals trying to hang on to their wealth. It's a recipe for disaster, and we are going to have a disaster. A so, a um, global the, system of rationing also feels like a disaster. Well, it is going to be a disaster. Okay. I'm not going to be. If, 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 if we, like one of the great dangers of, of global warming is wiping out our food crops. Um, and uh, there's one of the studies which I, uh, now a friend of mine called Tim Lenton, who's the Professor of Climate Science at Exeter University in the UK. He was commissioned by the OECD in 2021 to do a study of what would happen if we had a breakdown of the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. And he modelled what would happen using what's called a global circulation model, the models that climate scientists build that are pretty realistic simulations of the dynamics of the weather. They're not so good on precipitation, but they're very good on temperature and, and they can do the regional distributions and so on. And running that model with a two and a half degree increase in temperature and the breakdown of the AMOC, the prediction was that the area of the planet which was suitable for growing wheat, not all of which is used for wheat, of course, but the area that's suitable for it would go from 20% to 7%. And the area suitable for a corn would go from 14% to 5%. The area for rice would go from 2% to 3%. So there's a bit of a way in the difference area. But the basic outcome is there'd be probably about a 70% fall in food supplies if the AMOC breaks down. And now, that means global the, starvation. Do you know what the the mechan? I guess we should we should just talk to him to find out the mechanism about exactly how that would work. Because I you you say about the breakdown of the Atlantic currents, and I immediately think of this thing called the Azola event. Do you know about this? Mm -hmm. It's Which called one? the Azola event, and it's this. Uh, there's a big question at some point about what caused one of the more recent glaciations, or maybe an, an older glaciation, one of the glaciations. It was like anomalous yeah. in terms of its timing. And they realized that there was some kind of shift in the in the oceanic currents that created a warm spot in the Arctic. And there was a shallow, warm, freshwater sea that formed that got covered by this plant called Azola that fixed a tremendous amount of carbon from the atmosphere. And then oh. the uh, as it was fixing the carbon, what happened is that it started to get colder. And then the shallow, fresh sea became landlocked and all of the Azola died because the circulation changed and sunk and then sucked all the carbon out of the atmosphere and then the glaciation 
began. And so, mm. but there's two interesting things there because on one hand, the Azola is creating its own climate change. But on the other hand, by virtue of it being really, really warm, there's new land that's opened for agriculture. And so I wonder in this analysis, do they think about, okay, well, if Greenland suddenly becomes arable, does that change the calculation? <laughs> How quickly does it change the calculation? How long does it take topsoil to form? Okay. There's probably have... something. Do we? Is there not any topsoil underneath those places? Is that well, a of course not. question? So, well, unfortunately, yes, because it's rock. Okay. Uh, if you've got a, if you've got uh, two thousand meters of ice above you, you're not going to have soil. Okay. It's gonna, whatever moves is going to be scraped away, so it'll be rock. And then the question is, how fast does rock turn into topsoil? And I have some friends who are experts in topsoil, and I'm going back a long way for the last conversation I had with one of them. It was actually back at Cleveland Road in, in, in Sydney about 2007, I think. And I think he said it took about 300 to 400 years through normal weathering processes to create topsoil. So, so a place like uh, Russia has a huge advantage because it has a lot of permafrost and the permafrost as it melts is already soil and so you basically have lots of water lots of soil you drain it it's probably agriculturally quite profitable but Except a place that like it might america explode has while you're doing it say it again it might explode while you're doing it of course because of the if the if the if the if the if the, if the you get anaerobic breakdown you're going to get methane and you get the methane bombs, which are going off in Siberia right now. It's not the sort of thing we're doing on a human time scale. This is my point. Okay. Mm. So we, if, we, if we're going to do successfully, if we're going to be able to, you know, suddenly we can farm Greenland or we can farm Siberia, we're talking about doing it on a human time scale. Now, if we have a collapse in the food crops of Idaho and uh, Ukraine and Russia, um, then you want to have that, you want to be farming Siberia in, in a year. Not going to happen. I think there's a lot of fantasy thinking about what the, might be the positives out of climate change, and that's one of them, unfortunately. It's interesting that every single civilization has in some sense fallen prey to climate change, yeah. and, and yet the conversations tend to get waylaid into whether or not humans are the ones that are causing it. It seems to be beside the point to me in that the climate is, is definitely always changing and that that always threatens our prospects as a a civilization and that we need to think about how we're going to roll with the punches of climate change maybe yeah. more than we need to think about trying to stop some geological process because that seems inevitable even if we take the human element out of it well i still I actually frankly think we should be what we should have done as a species is work out that you know we evolved at roughly 280 parts per million carbon dioxide and generally speaking, that's been the situation for the animals that have evolved since the, um, you know, the dinosaurs got wiped out. Not quite that level, but reasonably. So we have a whole bunch of life forms, including ourselves, that are adapted to a climate which is generated by between 250 and 300 parts per million carbon. And we sort of said, OK, that's the thermostat. We're the people with the fingers on the thermostat. We've got to keep it between 250 and 300 and then let life evolve within that range. So we should have been managing the Earth's climate from the point at which we actually started affecting it, which really goes back to the, the mid-1800s. Um, now, of course, we didn't have the technology then. We do have the technology now. We could have done something about you know, minimising our carbon dioxide output, um, reflecting energy back into space, stopping humans becoming the overwhelmingly dominant mammal on the planet, letting the others have a chance. Um, e. Wilson has been says, spoke about reserving half the planet for non-human life, which I think, in my opinion, is, is a good idea, but even an underestimate, we should be reserving 70% of the planet for non-humans if we really do respect life. And so that's what we should have done, and we haven't. And we're going to be, as a result of it, we're going to be wiping out what's feasible for us. And then hopefully in the, the chaos and the breakdown, we will learn what we should have been in the very first place, which is, you know, the custodians of life on this planet. I really like the idea of humans as custodians of life on the planet. I think that that's a really valuable perspective that I definitely have. Shiloh's nodding. 
Yeah, I mean, humans are in this weird position, right? As animals, we have the ability to look back in time and look forward in time. I, I often, yeah. I've, I've recently been kind of characterizing humans as the time machine animals in that we have, we really can examine potential consequences that haven't occurred yet. And that allows us to even look at the other species and think about, you know, what's going wrong and even consider the the big wide ranging impacts of like, wait, is it, species diversification actually seems to be really healthy for an ecosystem. You know, you can just mess with like a little uh, bacterial environment. And at some point, if it's just one bacteria, they'll just kill themselves off. And so yeah, we have the unique ability to be custodians, should we rationalize that that's a good th I think it's hard to not come down on the conclusion that that's a smart thing to do. And uh, what's really weird is that people are terrified of decreasing populations. And on one hand, I think that they're terrified of it because if you start to think about it as a top down directive, then you end up in a position where humans do to themselves what they do to their domesticated animals. Reproduction is tightly mm -hmm. controlled. Sometimes I have this moment where I realize that everything that comes out of the food industry, the food economy, is the product of the manipulation of reproduction. And I have I, it's a weird moment because I it's it's strange to think that what you're you live off of the reproduction of other beings. And so what we do best is we manage that reproduction and we control it in order to be able to produce lots of fruits and vegetables and animals and eggs and butter and whatever. But we have a we we have a freaky time of turning it towards ourselves. Right? Like yeah, the history I mean, of turning that yeah. to humans is is not is not a pretty history. No, and it, it is one we have to we, we have to uh, embrace ultimately because we are the ultimate predator on this planet. I mean, it, it could have been possible that a you know a herbivore became the dominant intelligent species. Um, that's like kangaroos, for example. Okay, uh, if kangaroos evolved as the dominant species, they the ones got intelligence rather than apes. Uh, as it happens, kangaroos have a in, remarkable uh, a reproduction system where the female is almost always pregnant. And always has a joey in her pouch but if there's not enough food around her body reabsorbs the baby the the embryo mm. so they they self-regulate towards the the climate and therefore you you don't get plagues of kangaroos you get plagues of rabbits the rabbits breed like crazy and they're a herbivore so herbivores aren't going to be in a great advantage but it would you know if kangaroos have been the intelligent species we probably wouldn't be having this conversation okay it'd be uh it, it, we, our biology itself would control it. Now we don't have that advantage, and humans uh, have a you know we, we, a baby every nine months is feasible, terrifying prospect, but feasible. Um, most females are fertile enough that over a you know, average lifespan they could give birth to ten, and it's because we have uncontrolled uh, mortality so well, infant mortality in particular, that's a huge rate of reproduction. So you get, you know, over over a 20-year period, you've got a factor of five increase in the population. We don't go that far. We do have a certain amount of self-regulation we do now. The, the wealthier we are, the less children we tend to have. Um, but not not enough. I mean, we are still having growing populations. And we've just been used to that for a huge part of our existence. We've been, you know, we have the Black, Black Plague, which knocked out about 30% of the population. There are other calamities. It was one that knocked us back to, you know, in evolutionary time, you're probably aware of, that left us as a population of probably less than a 1,000 individuals in the bottom of Africa. Uh, so we've been through population squeezes in the past, and the environment has regulated our numbers. Mm. Now, because we are intelligent, we are the ultimate predator. And we don't, because we're omnivores, we don't just eat the, eat the prey, we eat what the food the prey eat as well. So we're undermining it. We have to realise that if we're going to be the, the dominant Prey, predator on the spent planet, we have to be a responsible predator, and that we can't be too many of us. Or if we want to expand, we've got to go off planet, well, which we're very close to being able to do. Okay, so there's two interesting threads there, because on one hand, I think that we are on track to decrease the population pretty significantly. If you look... Not, not fast enough. Not At least in the, in the developed world, certainly. In the developed world, certainly, right? Like, mm. there is there is the risk that the population pyramid is going to continue to narrow at the base as fewer and fewer people have children. There's, um, 
you know, I think that whatever the youngest generation is, the vast majority of them haven't had sex until the end of college. Like they, they're they're basically virginal. They they don't have relationships. They're certainly not reproducing. There's a lot of different manifestations of sexuality, but none of them are procreative the way that previous generations mm. were. And so it seems like what we're we're looking at, if that continues, is a generation that reproduces maybe 10 times less than this generation, which is already not reproducing a lot, right? I have a lot of women yeah. friends in their 30s and not that many babies. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm childless. My first wife uh, desperately wanted to have kids but had endometriosis. So again, through seven years of IVF proving she couldn't get pregnant. So I haven't contributed to the human population in that sense. And I'm quite happy that I haven't in the sense because I think, well, I wouldn't want a child growing up in what I think is going to come the way of the next generation. But um, it's very, very hard to, we, we'd have to totally change our social structure because part of the, the process of nurturing and, and communicating with young people is part of what gives us a, a culture. And if it's easy enough to do when you, each family is having two or three kids. It was much better when that was in you know, Cro-Magnon days when they'd all get together and party and there'd be you know, rituals for them to go through and an entire structure to inculcate them with the, with the culture of that civilization. We don't have it these days because there's bloody nuclear family, family, which puts a huge strain on the parents raising it and all sorts of pressures and stresses and so on. And that's why a lot of your friends aren't having kids. Mm. But if we were going to actually reduce from where we are to what would be a sustainable population, not just for us, but for the other species on the planet, then we could be talking one to fall from 8 billion to, to 1 billion. Uh, but to do that, you know, you would have, in, in, in that case, if you want to do it very quickly, you'd have a large number of people who do not take part in child raising, don't have, have that you know, fundamental part of being a biological creature. And so it, it's, it, it's, incredible. It, it's, it's a dilemma. It's not something which is easily solved. It's, we've got ourselves in a hell of a predicament. And to get out of it, uh, you know, there's two ways to do it. We can let nature destroy our population, which I think is like what's going to happen. Or we could work ways to manage it down. Um, and I, I don't think we're going to have sufficient collective intelligence to do that. Well, isn't the one pile child policy in China universally seen as a total disaster for the, not necessarily in terms of controlling population, I think it was probably pretty successful at that, mm. but I think socially, wasn't that just. Yeah, it was difficult. I mean, like I've got a lot of, a lot of Chinese friends. I was in China in 81, 82. I've been back half a dozen times since. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed China's culture in general. Uh, but they really were, they really missed having the kids. It was, um, and, and, and there's a, you know, a lot of, um, uh, I've forgotten the expression for, for killing female babies, but there's a huge amount of that. Um, so you've got, a, you've got a population pyramid where there are many more males than females now as part of that whole experience. Um, so it, it's, it's awful and the, the impact that it had. And if you were going to do it in, like at, at, at the large scale, you'd want to have people like a family of 10 or 10 families raising, you know, one or two children. So you all got involved in a, in a collective raising process. And you try, try to reproduce the Cro-Magnon societies we used to have. We lived in bands of 150, which it's extended out to 10,000, 20,000 with tribes. But that, that's, that was, a, if we look at, say, what, as an animal, what was our ideal arrangement? And it was tribes of about 150 of villages of about 150 and tribes of about 10,000. And that's what gave us the, the best, in a social sense, the best life we've ever had. There's some of the most exciting things that I've seen in the social media space are the ones that help people network with their friends to buy houses next to each other for people mm. that have similar interests and goals in terms of family life to buy property together in order to be able to return to this more communal living. And I'm seeing, because this is would be what, third generation social media? First generation is MySpace. Second generation is the giants we have right now. Third generation is social media that's centered around bringing people together that have a cause and helping them manifest that in the world. And Shiloh's parents are visiting right now and his mom was talking about uh, a place called 
the village somewhere in Ohio or Arizona, I don't remember where, but where people that were of a retired age were getting together and organizing to buy services. So instead of everybody having a car, they would hire a car service so that you could get rides to and from the grocery store. They would have somebody that would come and and help clean and take care of stuff around the house, and they would all pool their resources in order to be able to afford the things that are generally only available to the ultra wealthy. Wow. And that's um, and it, it, that that is a sensible idea in trying to recreate the smaller communities that we used to be part of when when we first evolved. And uh, you know the Dun- you know the Dunbar number, I presume. Yeah, the the maximum number of people that you can reasonably maintain social connection to, which is about one hundred and fifty. Uh, and when when anthropologists started, it was Dunbar was a mathematical biologist who worked that out for simian populations in terms of the size of their cerebral cortex, and then projected it for humans and guessed that about one hundred and fifty. And anthropologists went checking, and my God, it was about one hundred and fifty. Was the and then, then there, what would happen? You got beyond that level, you'd split into another group, and the tribes, the, the, you know, the, you had villages and tribes, and the tribes might be, you know, twenty or thirty of those communities. So you get up to seven, ten thousand people, and they had kings at various times, kings and queens. There was a summer queen, and, and there were ceremonies and systems to raise people. And when you look at them, and uh, we, the, our best way of looking at these days is to look at, you know, still surviving uh, hunter gatherer societies. And one thing I'd highly recommend doing is reading Nelson Mandela's Long Road to Freedom, his autobiography, because he talks about his early life as a member of the Zosa tribe. And he says at one point, he said, at my at that particular age, I can imagine no better life than being a member of the Zosa. So the strength of bonds that existed in those societies obliterates what we're used to in the fragmented societies we've generated in industrial capitalism. And if we were going to really bring about a decent planet, not just for the other species, but also for ourselves. We need to find a way to recreate that. I saw a poll on Twitter. Again, not scientific. Somebody had posted the poll. I think it was like a Pew Research poll or something, which was that the vast majority of people below the age of 25 right now find the most satisfaction in their lives from their work not from family or reproduction. Yeah, yeah, um, and it's a it's a pity. It just shows how we've, you know, broken down at the nature we have as as, as a as an animal um, for the sake of the social system we've created, and uh, with work. I mean, what's going on with work for most people is work is the way the community is. Okay? Work is the people you're getting together for a common purpose. You know, it might be slipping hamburgers and McDonald's or it might be working in, you know, a vampire squid, preferably it's working in a place like Tesla or um, or SpaceX where you've got some shared, you know, common goal that motivates you as well. But, yeah, the major community you've got are the people you work with these days and that gets exploited. The, the mass majority we end up working for the, the billionaires rather than working for our community. But, yeah, that, 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 that's, that, you know, the, the, the only community we've got left really is the workplace. Which is why it's so freaking lonely being an artist or being a podcaster or being a, <laughs> this is our, hanging out with you is, is about as close as it gets. We, uh, well, it's the same thing for me. And like, you know, I think you're quite right. I mean, like I'm, I've been on, I got married about three years ago and my wife and I've been together for about seven years. She has no interest in what I do intellectually. There's a couple of funny stories I can tell on that front. But, uh, you know, that's, I got that with, I'm with her, then I've got, you know, that family feeling back at home and, the extended family in Thailand, even more so. Um, but most of the time, my socialising is through meeting up with people like yourself, Nate Hagen, uh, you know, and having a conversation with people. And where there's a shared spirit, it's part of why we, you know, run these podcasts and have these discussions. But then, bang, you know, I turn the podcast off and I'm in a flat in my own right now. Um, so, yeah, we are very isolated. And then the connections come through the Ethernet and the Internet. I mean, it makes um, me really, it makes me really happy. Like you've been on our, sh- you've been here before and it makes me really happy when we have people come back multiple times because I feel like I'm actually making productive relationships as opposed to just these yeah. one-off conversations that just disappear. I'm looking forward to meeting you in Austin on that front as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah. But like uh, Nate, for example, Nate Hagens, he approached me to uh, go on his, uh, the Great Simplification podcast. And then we met up in Finland because we were both uh, going there for a talk by Simon Machow on, 
the resource availability for a, for a mineral space as opposed to a fossil fuel based economy in the future got on famously and you know there's like you mentioned michael hudson is a very close friend of mine um and uh the, the a large community of, of like-minded people around the world. I get supported by them on Patreon. That's a plug. I'd like some more Patreon supporters Me too. and Substack. But there's feedback that goes on with those groups as well. I'm running an online lecture class with about 200 people. That's just a fabulous community. Mm. Um, so you get to the stage where you're bonding because you have this shared philosophy. And again, that's what I think if you look back and look again, that's why I think Mandela's book is such a great example of that. The, the tribe itself generates the philosophy. And then that gives you that sense of being and, and sense of belonging at the same time. And one reason why we are so you know, discordant in modern civilization is that's the best thing we get. It. It's exploited for the workplace. And that's the one place we've got a remnant of that. That's why it matters so much to so many of us. But it's a bastardized version of what we used to have and what we should have. I think it makes people, so, at least some portion of people, pretty unhappy too, because the workplace is not necessarily the people that they would hang out with if it was yeah. up to them. Or you get kind of thrown in with somebody who's got to be your best friend eight hours a day, and you didn't really have much say in who that person was necessarily. And I think that, that leads to a lot of pain also. Oh, it does. Like, I was lucky when I worked at Kingston. I wish I got a chance to teach town 19 staff rather than six. But I hired six staff at that at place trying to shape a, a university economics department that was going to promote non-orthodox thinking and economics. And to this day, that those are most of my best friends. Uh, Rex McKenzie, uh, you'll find him on, on Twitter. Devram Yulmaz, who's now working for the French Development Agency. Um, there was a, a, a real, because we had that shared philosophy again, it, it was a place we really looked forward to seeing those people at work. Now, there were the other staff of the department who were the old neoclassical boring types, and that wasn't exactly fun. But yeah, if you, if you can pull together a whole community, then that's, that's the pleasure. Of, of being able to select people who share a philosophy with you, which in most workplaces you can't get it. There's going to be some asshole you've got to put up with. Uh, one of the assholes I put up with, his name was actually very close. We used to call him Colon. His name was, I'll just take one letter. I put in one extra letter and you had his name, but he really was an asshole. And, uh, you know, tolerating, you know, you've got to put up with that twerp every day. It sort of took the pleasure out of work. I mean, I guess the more that you can align your work with what you're interested in anyways, the closer you'll get to spending your time with people yeah. that you resonate with. I think that's one of the yeah. tricks is for young people is finding their way into something that's productive and that they can pay their rent, but also is something that they're deeply interested like in. It's something that invigorates them, something they would be thinking about anyways. And that's a hard thing for people to find a match with. You look like you had something uh -huh. to say. No, I just, I think that we've created a situation where people have to spend a lot of time on their work and work tends to force people to move around a lot. And so it's harder and harder to be able to get these long-term connections. And there was a big promise of remote work that all of a sudden people that had email jobs and online jobs or computer jobs would be able to live wherever. And you had people moving back to be closer to their families, to be closer to their networks, where they came from. And now employers are starting to go back the other way because there's all these other incentives that pull people back into the office. You own a ton of corporate real estate. It's hard for you to justify letting people not come into the office because that real estate doesn't happen to be worth anything anymore. Like San Francisco is facing this right now, where... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was... I mean, I'm hardly amazed at San Francisco. I went there for a conference on multi-agent modeling back when I was doing my PhD, I think in 1995, and I couldn't wait to get out of the place oh. because I found myself having to walk past about 500 homeless people to go between where I was staying. And I thought there's all things I was staying, a cheap room in the YWCA, God knows how a bloke got into the YW, but I did. <laughs> and I had to walk three blocks diagonally to get to the Hilton Hotel where the conference was. And there were about 500 people, homeless, standing around 44-gallon drums with flames coming out to keep warm. And I couldn't wait to get out of the bloody city. It was a four-day conference I stayed at for two days. I uh, just couldn't stand it. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, I, it, I, so to, be fair, to be fair, you were basically staying in the Tenderloin, which is the absolute... It's it's the place that has the greatest struggles in San Francisco and always has. Yeah, I know, but it, it you know. Ooh. I mean, it's, I gotta <laughs> say, I gotta say, we were just uh, there like last 
Last we weren't week. in the Tenderloin. We weren't in the Tenderloin, yeah. but but they they actually enacted a pop, they they did some sort of big sting recently where they arrested something like a hundred different drug dealers and they arrested open drug users in San Francisco. And it feels very different because we go there. We think we've been there five or six times this year. And there was something very different about it this time around. So better or worse? Much better. Much, Good. much, like much like better. So whatever they did seems to be working. And I, I do think that it's in some sense about controlling the flow of these uh, kind of zombie drugs to people and tolerating the open use of these drugs, which seems to have, you know, cut down on the homeless crisis. Uh, significantly uh, yeah i mean in america's a done weird situation like that i mean one reason i like living in amsterdam is because the the dutch had a really weird approach to homelessness they bought houses for people well they had the they carrot and stick them. thing right like they they said yeah you know you're not allowed to do drugs in public but if you get caught you it's your choice do you want to be given housing and given job training, given opportunities to get clean, or you can go to jail. So it was kind of like a either or, or situation. And uh, maybe yeah. just because it's so small there too, it, it was easy to enforce and implement. I don't know if something on the scale of the United States, if we would be able to pull something off like that. I, I think America's war on drugs is what set a hell of a lot of this up. I mean, the idea that you could criminalize and get rid of drug consumption. Uh, yeah. Did you see that you may have seen on Twitter um, a bunch of porpoises taking a puffer fish and, and squeezing it and causing it to pop out its its poison and getting stoned on it? <laughs> no, it's actually that's quite incredible. A, no, seriously, yeah. Um, so, like, we, we 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 all go for you know psychedelic experiences as species. It's part of the hey, do you want to try this? Um, you know, it isn't just humans who do it, but it's a question of whether you do it so much you can't function. And, and what drugs you consume and the impact they have. But the whole idea of trying to ban it, you know, and banning marijuana for Christ's sake, you know, and you know, if you, if you, if alcohol as well, Americans try to prohibit it. The extent to which Americans have tried to control people's capacity to get themselves high and then end up with, the, with letting the criminal system take over and social breakdown. It's you know, been a lesson in how, how not to control people's desire to have a good time. Yeah, and it seems like what you really want is just not to have to step over drunk people in the street. But so, oh, so yeah, if, that's what, awful. if that's what you're trying to control, that seems like a much easier task to control than just banning the substances outright, which is disastrous. Yeah, well, like for example, the one, the one reason I don't, I'm glad I'm not living in London anymore. I mean, I enjoyed London for the intellectual stimulation there. It was great. I have a whole lot of people working in similar fields to me and conversations were fabulous. But I, every 30 meters walking through the heart of London, you're going to bump into somebody who's homeless. And I'd like to say at the railway station near where I used to live at Waterloo, whole community, about 25 or 30 people were sleeping outside what used to be a, a, a fire station. And it just, it, it becomes awful. Um, so, you know, the, you, letting people become homeless is a, is a tragic breakdown of your own society. And there's a very a funny video. I wish I could find a copy of it again. It's probably on YouTube somewhere. But a, 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 a news program brought a bunch of Solomon Islanders to Sydney to show them, uh, you know, advanced civilization. And they were walking past a person who was homeless and uh, and they said, oh, what's he doing sitting on the ground there? And the television crew said, he's homeless. And they said, what's homeless? They said, oh, he doesn't have a way to sleep. You let somebody have to sleep in the open here? Is it, if, if we have somebody who's homeless, we build them a house. And so these Solomon Islanders who were brought to the country to so-called education and experience ended up starting a charity for the homeless and because it was just incomprehensible to them coming from such a strong community. And that's a bit back to the comment about Zosa, the Zosa tribe and Nelson Mandela. But the sense of community they had was so strong they would not tolerate the thought that somebody could be homeless. Now, we've got such a breakdown. We walk past homeless people all the time. And it just made me feel dreadful doing that in London. And I couldn't wait to get out of the place. And I get to Amsterdam. I think I've seen two or three homeless people there somewhere, maybe, occasionally. And normally they're the complete down and out is somebody who would never, never be functional. So you, you, the difference between some societies today is enormous. But the main difference is we lo we've lost that sense of community that would even imagine letting somebody become homeless in the first place. Well, in this country, at least, I think some of it can be traced back to the closure of the psychiatric institutions 
that yeah, were becoming really abusive yeah. and dilapidated. And instead of cleaning them up, the solution was, ah, oh, let's just let everybody out on the streets. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are people who just don't have the mental cap- capability to function properly. And they were exploited and, you know, awful treatment of people in psychiatric homes. If you're a fan of Terminator, the Terminator movie series, you know, that's part of the theme of Term- Terminator 2. That sort of dreadful treatment of inmates by uh, by the people who are willing to go and work in a place like that in the first place. So there's a real danger of the institutions themselves. But they were probably better than letting them become homeless and wander around the streets. The same thing was done in Sydney. And I remember seeing people who were just standing at, at uh, traffic lights waiting for cars to go past so they could try to bludge a cigarette off the car, off the car driver. Yeah, it seems like a confluence of things that get wrapped up into the term homelessness too, right? You have open drug users, you have mentally unstable people that, like you said, aren't capable of functioning in, in a productive way. And then you have people that are just in between, right? People who maybe had some really bad luck. And I, I wonder how much confusion results from just blending all of those characters together and calling it homelessness. That makes it it's a very a lot difficult of thing. Yeah. I mean, I, when I was in San Francisco and I just got sick of the place and wanted to leave, I uh, hopped into the uh, car to be taken out to the airport and a homeless person came past and said, can you buy this magazine? And I jumped out of the car to buy it off him. And he said, thanks very much. I've got a wife and two kids I'm trying to support. Highly intelligent man, down on his luck, selling a newspaper to try to keep his kids alive and his wife alive. And just thought, you know, what an awful situation we have that this has become commonplace in our societies. Yeah. America does, so I'm looking at mental health charts and like depression and anxiety are difficult things to quantify because they're so soft. But America does seem to have a really high prevalence of something like schizophrenia, which is a a, a perhaps more objective measure that you can imagine cross-culturally would be tabulated more accurately than like depression or anxiety. And I think that that's significant. Like, I think America might have more mental health problems than other places. And so the problem I would agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've, we should I've ask the American in the room. Hold on, I feel like we're beating up on Americans unfairly. American in the room, do you feel like <laughs> that's an accurate? I mean, mental health is a really interesting concept by itself. You know, it's a it's a relatively modern idea in some sense. Uh, if you look at most indigenous cultures, or if you go back in history, uh, insanity was reserved for a very specific. Even in the Western civilization, it's reserved for a very specific kind. Of mental disorder, this idea that anxiety and depression are mental disorders, like everything's a disorder these days. And I think in the past it would yeah. have been considered like, okay, this god is maybe out of balance with this other god in you, and there would have been some sort of more social remedy for these things. Like, while well, you're depressed because you're not actually, you know, chemically depressed, you're just miss your 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 spirit your your motivations are misaligned with what you spend your day doing something like that and uh and we also we, we've got the we've got the isolation of crowds i mean um you can be in an enormous crowd of people none of whom you know whereas if you go back to, again to the cro magnon societies and, and and tribal societies, everybody you know you might not like somebody and that's often what leads to a schism and, and a new group forms but you know everybody everybody knows you and and that level of self knowledge is just lost. So we've got you know it, it, it's 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 an enormous problem, and out of the isolation I, will come issues like depression. I, I think that I think we can all actually do something about that one. I, I I've made a change in my own life where I I consciously try to smile at people when I walk past them on the street or wherever. And there's a certain proportion of people that are like very uncomfortable with that. But I think on balance, it makes the world better. Like it makes my world better. It makes me feel better. And I think every uh, pretty regularly, other people, I think it makes them happier too. They'll they'll be kind of surprised. And uh, that was the most difficult part of New York is that uh, the trains, for the most part, are set up in such a way that you face the person across from you. And yeah. so you sit down on the train first thing in the morning, and the if you're not looking at your phone or down at a book, you're going to be looking out the window that's across from you. And so you're kind of catching the eye of somebody who's across from you. Nobody ever smiles. Nobody's ever happy to be seen by somebody else in New York. And so there was this constant feeling of just the terrible drudgery of seeing people, but recognizing that they didn't want to be seen and they didn't want to see you. And so it creates this 
accelerated loop of alienation because you're technically surrounded by people, but never forgetting the fact that they don't want anything to do with you. A couple years into it, you're wearing sunglasses on the noonday subway. (laughs) You think that will happen to you, buddy? It will happen to you. I never got that far. But but look, I smile a lot at people I go out into the world. I smile. Everybody's really nice to me, but that doesn't make me feel less lonely living in the middle of nowhere. You know, the only thing that... The loneliness, yeah. Right? Like, the only thing that makes me feel less lonely is when we go down to the Bay Area, where I'm I'm from. So I grew up there. I have friends there. I have family there. It's a familiar landscape. It's a place that I love deeply. And then that feeling of, you know, who am I and where am I goes away. And it feels very good because you're just networked in with this place that you're from. And people don't stay in the places that they're from anymore because they're economically depressed. Like, you, I knew, we met a girl who was from Newfoundland. And she talks about how she goes to Newfoundland and she walks off the plane and it feels like home deeply and yeah. viscerally. And it's a relaxation that you experience when you walk out. And she can't have that because there's nothing to do on Newfoundland. She doesn't want to catch lobster, <laughs> right? So yeah. she's in Western yeah. she's in Western Oregon trying to make it as an artist, but there's no way back for her unless she makes it well, and I, uh, retires there or something. I was lucky in the sense of being raised in Sydney. I mean, I look back and I regard my life as being like a suburban boy in a very suburban environment. But Jesus, when it comes to suburbs, it's pre- pretty hard to be living in Sydney. You know, if you hop on the train with your mates and go 15 stations to a surfing beach that you, you know, anybody in, even in California, you'd, you'd die for a beach like Cronulla beach. Mm. Um, uh, and it, it's, it just meant there was a sense of enjoying the physical environment uh, as well as enjoying the community. And as, as part of the Australian culture that uh, I think comes from the side of the convict side, because the convicts, were united against the waters. The waters were the assholes. The convicts were quite often political refu- refugees. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you were stealing bread for a political reason as well as to stay alive. Um, you had the toll, but you had a whole bunch of, 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 uh, political rebels who were sent out to Australia as well. So that sense of camaraderie and, and also you're living in a very harsh environment as well, not, not on the coast so much, but certainly inland. So you've got to take care of each other. And, um, and and that gave me a, a very strong cultural sense. And when I get back to Sydney, I still feel that, and um, and that's a pleasure. And uh, you know, the, the Sydney's big enough to be a viable city as well. So uh, yeah, I'd feel for somebody from Newfoundland. Well, and that's something that economics doesn't offer a solution to the way that we have it now because there's something ineffable about being able to stay with your people and to stay with your community but people have to move for jobs they have to move for economic reasons and economic migrants have been the way that the capitalist machine functions since they invented factories basically probably since they invented agriculture but certainly since yeah. they invented factories and that's that's what I said that's perverted our social structures we used to be in physically located communities we we have any, that's why you, you talk to people from Aboriginal, Aboriginal I mean in general. So you have American Native Indians and Aborigines in Australia, um, the, 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 you know, the African tribes, the sense to which you identify with the land from which you came is enormous and you have respect for the land as well. We've lost it. We've destroyed that. And we're destroying, that will ultimately destroy our sedentary civilizations too. So we've, we've my analogy uh, for humans is we're the opposite of ants. Ants are intelligent, individually stupid and collectively intelligent. We're the reverse. Mm. <laughs> That's interesting. Interesting. Like that. Hey, would you mind if I uh, took a quick bathroom break really quick? I'm sorry. I've been drinking yeah, too sure. much. Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's just take a stretch break. Yeah. Could give, give, I usually I'll, take I'll do a, the same, actually. Yeah, it takes us about yep. 10 minutes. So let's meet back at 44. Yep. Big news, everyone. We have officially announced ticket sales for Demysticon 2024. This is our first scientific conference, and what we're going to be doing is we are bringing together our favorite podcast guests in Austin, Texas, April 7th and 8th of 2024. And we're going to have a slew of incredible speakers. For right now, we don't have everyone confirmed, but of the ones that we do have confirmed, we have our favorite scientist, Pierre-Marie Robitaille, 
We have ancient mythology scholar John F. White of the Craig and Ford YouTube channel. We have Ogi Ogas, consciousness researcher. We have Steve Keen, economist. And we have many more that are on deck that we will announce very, very soon. So check out the link in the description. And we hope to see you in Austin, Texas of 2024. How do we leverage new economic theories to be able to start fixing these things? Like you have this one idea about the carbon credits and the yeah. the flattening of the world in terms of the rich and the very and the very poor. What other ideas do you have? We've got to totally redesign economic theory. Economic theory is a load of garbage right now, uh, facing on utility maximization of humans as if we're the only things on the planet. Having a model of production that involves combining labor and capital together and producing goods, which means you have magic because you're producing outputs with no inputs from the natural environment, it's all nonsense. So what you have to do is go back to the foundation that the physiocrats had who precede Adam Smith. And they knew they didn't, the, the word energy hadn't been invented, but they knew energy was, you know, the free energy we find in the universe is what we use to produce human civilization. So you need to redo that. And I've worked out the mathematics of doing it. Very simple. Uh, basically saying, I think I may have used this phrase with you last time around. It's one of my favorite sayings now. Labor without energy is a corpse and capital without energy is a sculpture. So to motivate ourselves and machines, we need energy as an input. And once you're using energy, you're in the laws of thermodynamics. You know you're going to you're, you're, you're transforming energy from one form into another. You're necessarily generating waste etc cetera, etc cetera. so you suddenly realize that everything you do affects the biosphere so if you start from that foundation you never have the ignorance that neoclassical economists have about the biosphere now would have an economic which realized that to have a advanced civilization on a biosphere you've got to be damaging it mm -hmm. and therefore it'd be your responsibility to limit how much damage you do and that would have been the orientation we had right from the outsets so i'm, I'm trying to develop that a full approach to economics now that's one of the books i'm working on while I'm here in the Budapest Center for Long-Term Sustainability, the title of the book is Rebuilding Economics from the Top Down, and I'm showing how you can build economics without needing microeconomics. So what the neoclassicals do is garbage anyway, but you can build it from build macroeconomics under sound foundations. But that starts from the role of energy. And then with that awareness, you don't get the stupidity that you know, the economists have been responsible for for the last 250 years, ever since Adam Smith. How much does policy actually depend upon economic theory? Far too much. Mm. Far too much. People, I mean, economists are the bunch of wankers that will sometimes say, oh, uh, you know, we don't have any real influence. And at the same time, they'll say things like Samuelson said, I don't care who writes a nation's law as long as I can write its textbooks. <laughs> so the minds are shaped by what they learn in university. And it's a disease. It's a mental virus. So I've, I'm so glad I broke out of it when I was 18 years old. I was very lucky to have a lecturer who opened my eyes to some of the flaws in the theory, and then I saw how bad the foundations of that theory were. So I've been a critic for 50 years, which is pretty damn lucky, 52 years, actually. Um, most people got sucked into it, and it becomes a, 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 it's a utopia. It describes a utopian system where there's no concentration of power, we don't need government. In fact, government makes things worse. There's no need for a coordination. The market does everything. And it becomes a mental virus. So I think that's a huge source of our problems. And then when you get to policy making, I mean, like for example, I've seen with working on Carbon Tracker, I've seen how the work of economists is infested, and that's probably the best word to describe it, infested everything. Finance sector, um, government policy, journalism, et cetera, et cetera. It's incredibly, it's probably the most influential thing we have, and it's going to kill us. You, sorry, say that last sentence again. I said it's the most influential thing we have and it's going to kill us. I have, I, I think I might have a specific form of autism where I don't understand unreferenced pronouns. And so it here is economics? It, it is economics. Economic theory is going to destroy the economy and take human civilization with it, and potentially. We, yeah, we. And you think that that's because there's not a sufficient inclusion of of energy calculations inside of economic theory? Initially, it begins from that because it meant that we ignored the physical environment. We have the whole theory of economics, starting from Adam Smith, which says that you know wealth comes from the division of labor. And whereas we look at his predecessors, the physiocrats, and there's a book written by one of his physiocratic predecessors only about 10 years before Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations. Uh, it's called uh, Richard Cantillon's The Author. 
I've forgotten the actual title. Um, but Cantillon began by saying land is the source of all wealth. And by what, what he meant by land is basically the energy the land absorbs from the sun. And because they, 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 the this, this school came out of, um, it's called an essay in economic theory. It was translated. Uh, that's the translated title. He's, a, he's an Irishman who worked in France. And that's where the physiocrats were. And France was a very rural society, much more so than England, and certainly much more so than Scotland at the time. And yeah, they saw you put one seed in the ground and a thousand seeds come out of it later. So they knew it wasn't the work the farmer did. It was the, you know, just stopping insects uh, attacking it meant you got the bounty yourself. So it was a free gift. They called it a free gift of nature. Now, if you had that orientation, we would have realized that without the free gift of nature, we have nothing. Whereas economists believe we can make everything without the free gift of nature, which is nonsense. So the delusions that have come out of economic theory, I think, are the main threat to the, to the survival of capitalism. It occurs to me that these are theories that were formulated when we were still on the linear phase of our logarithmic growth curve. Mm. And so their theory is very much informed by their time where there's this belief in the limitless capacity of colonization and extraction and mining and everything else that these empires were were busy doing because the planet was still so big. It seemed compared impossible to, us, yeah. to imagine, right, compared to us, compared to the scale of our civilizations, there was a point where it seemed impossible that humans could ever run up against their limits because even if they did they could just you know continue filling up the the new world yeah and that's a very true i think i've forgotten whether it's bormal or buchanan i think it's bormal william bormal who coined the phrase uh cow cowboy economy which is the phrase you're phase you're talking about and then you call the spaceship economy which is the phase we're in now and of course if you the cowboy continues growing the cowboy turns the prairie into the spaceship and then the main threat you have to the survival of the civilization is the spaceship itself and the damage we're doing to it. So yeah, it, it did come out of that. But at the same time, if we had been, it, it's one of these accidents of history. If Smith hadn't turned the idea of land the source of all wealth to labor, then we could well have had an economics which, when the theories of thermodynamics came along, would have been perfectly well integrated with the physics, maybe even preceded the physics. And then we would have had a awareness back in those cowboy days that this exponential trend can't continue forever. But instead, you have a bunch of economists now who, as Nat Hagen says, are energy blind. They have no bloody idea of the role of energy whatsoever because it doesn't form a part of their models. So you have William Nordhaus in 1991 saying that it was really hard, really hard to work out what could damage the bulk of the economy, which meant manufacturing, mining, services blah, 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 in the next 50 to 75 years. But if you knew energy was an essential input to those things, it's obvious what's going to damage it. So that blindness to our reliance upon the natural environment is a huge part of the fact that we're now destroying the natural environment and therefore destroying our capacity to maintain a civilization on it. Well, so the same way that Adam Smith is writing in the what mid-1700s, during the first rise of industrialization, where for the first time it becomes true that labor is where wealth comes from, because beforehand you had land. It wasn't actually. It, why do you not? Why do you think not? It was coal. The reason we got that growth, you, the division of labor only made sense when you could attach a spinning jenny to a steam engine. Okay, mm. so like you know, there, there, there was certainly the like the. the the spinning jenny, which is probably the very first major manufacturing um, scaling up of human labor, I don't rather than having know what a single person. Jenny is. I know oh, the so, the American version of that. I think might be the cotton gin. I don't know what a spinning jenny is. Yeah, possibly. Yes, it was actually like a, it's a, just a, it's a wheel, a spinning wheel. A spin oh, for, wheel. for weaving for the textile okay. industry. I see. Yeah, that's okay. right. So, like initially, one person. When you look back the early days of the of the textile industry. It was basically outsourced to houses and predominantly wives would be working on a spinning wheel, spinning wool into um, into into weaving into you know, into you know, forgotten the bloody term, but being able to weave clothing that way on looms. And, uh, and 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 then when the first one was going from having one person spinning a wheel to one person spinning six wheels, 
And that was made sense in, in Scotland as it happened because wages were higher in Scotland than they were in France. So if you could replace six workers with one machine and one worker, that was cheaper uh, in Scotland, but it would be more expensive in France. So that's one reason the Industrial Revolution began in Scotland. But then very rapidly, you know, you reach your limit. One person can't spin 16 wells. Six is about as many as they can manage to get the tension right uh, on their energy. But you then attach that to a steam engine and bang, you can go to a thousand, et cetera, et cetera. So the real growth in industrialization was out of harnessing the energy of burning coal. So it goes right back to fossil fuels. But didn't you need people to dig that stuff out and to mine it and to bring it? And right, because you had these. No, you, I, you, 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 people have to operate the machines. But, they're, you know, you, you don't dig it up with your bare hands, uh, even even using a stick. You know, it, it's us combining with machinery that lets us produce the, the enormous amount we produce now. And the, the, when you look really and say, what was the, how do we generate the wealth we have now? It's by exploiting fossil fuels. And Do you, th uh, do you think hmm. that uh, Smith, when he was writing, assumed that there was basically a constant energy density to the landscape in all countries? No, I, I think, um, he, again, he was energy blind as well. Because if you look at, like, you look at how he reacted to the physiocrats, he actually went and visited the physiocrats in France. He took a young nobleman for an education tour of the, the continent and met with uh, Francois Canet, who was the most influential of the of the physiocrats. And he knew their argument about land being the source of all the la value. And he said, no, it's labour, the division of labour. And when you look at France versus Scotland, France is incredibly fertile and lots of fields and very rural. And Scotland's not very fertile at all and lots of factories. And then he said, it's not land, it's the division of labour. He wasn't aware that coal was stored solar power. Okay. Now, he, 1776 was the publication date of the uh, of the Wealth of Nations, and I think 1767 uh, was the year in which uh, 1770, yeah, 76, 67, something like that, Nature 65. One or two years difference, I think, between when the Wealth of Nations came out and when, when, when James Watt invented the steam engine. And it wasn't, of course, the first steam engine. It was the first with a governor, and therefore you got much more efficient conversion and, and a condenser. You got much more efficient energy conversion of the coal. Initially, it was done to actually pump water out of coal mines because they used to use horses for that, turning a wheel. Then they put that up. It was much more powerful, much more efficient. And then that meant you could get much more coal out much more effectively. Uh, now, they did. coal was just this thing you dug out of the ground. They weren't aware that it was stored solar energy, but that's what it is. So the huge growth in our wealth is, is using energy in the place of human labor. And the, what the machines do is enable us to replace having to use an intelligent person to tell them what to do, slavery and so on. <coughs> With a machine, you're designed to make the same mo movements and create the same thing. <coughs> so if, if, if um, and I don't blame Smith for this, I can understand why he made that leap and why and why you didn't realize it was wrong but it's one of those accidents of history as a result of that you generated the profession of economics which virtually to this day still doesn't understand the role of energy and production how does this calculation change for you if nuclear energy becomes widespread because it seems like oh, then you dis then the energy problem is solved and you and there are other limitations but the waste problem is not the waste problem not. That's true, but there are. I mean, you can shoot it into the sun. There's ways that you can do uh, this. No, not thinking, not thinking about I nuclear. Know... <laughs> I'm not thinking about nuclear waste. I'm thinking about waste energy, uh, because um, like if you if you ever ever interviewed Tom, um, what's Tom, Tom Murphy? Do you know mm -hmm. Tom Murphy at all? Physicist right. Tom Murphy, highly worth getting in touch with, uh, and Tom. It's part of a group that I'm involved with for a discussion group on a regular basis on the on the web. But Tom wrote a, a brilliant post called "Finite Physicist Meets Exponential Economist," <laughs> and he, what happened was he sat to sit down at a dinner and found himself next to a fairly famous economist. Not I have I've tried to get out of it, who it was. He won't tell me. Um, it, it wasn't. I thought it might have been Paul Roma. It wasn't. Um, but he he said this guy had no idea of the role of energy and, and no idea of the laws of thermodynamics. And now I'm not thinking about waste in the sense of um, uh, thermodynamical waste energy yet. What I am thinking about is if we were using nuclear power, we'd simply increase the strain we're putting on the planet. 
at the moment. We would we need to reduce the strain we're putting on the bias, so we don't want to add more to it. But as Tom's point in this discussion with this, uh, one of his points in this discussion was that if you look at the rate of growth of the GDP, it's almost exactly the same as the rate of growth of energy. And if you have a rate of growth of 2. Point, I think it's 2.3% per annum, that means a tenfold increase in your load on the planet every century. So one century is 10, two is 100, three is the 1,000, four is 10,000, okay. Uh, and he said, at this rate, even completely forgetting about global warming, just now with the waste energy for thermodynamic processes, if we continue down that track, uh, I think within 300 years, maybe I think it was 400 years, the, from the waste energy alone, the surface temperature of the planet would be 100 degrees Celsius. Just the waste energy of machines moving and people moving yeah. and engines running. The, and Simply thermodynamics, simply the second law, okay? Entropy. We would generate, if we, if we continued for another four centuries, the rate of growth we think now is normal, within four centuries, we would be, well, we wouldn't exist, obviously, because once, if, once we hit 30 degrees, 35 degrees, that's it. But like it would be 100 if we kept on doing it. So there is a limit. We can go along for no more than 400 years as we are now, even without global warming, even without damaging the biosphere. Our that's, electric that's an cars, absolute hard limit. Our no, it doesn't. It's simply thermodynamics. It, it, you necessarily, the, the, you, you, if you know the, I mean, I'm no expert on entropy, but I just, I'm, I'm certainly aware of it. You cannot generate work without generating waste. Okay car no heat engines and all that sort of thing. And when, when you do the math, and Tom is much better at the math than I am, uh, you literally have four centuries until such time as we'd actually raise the temperature of the planet to 100 degrees Celsius. And I think five or it's a ridiculously small number of centuries, um, you'd, hit, you'd hit the surface of the temperature of the sun. So we have a hard and fast limit on this planet, and we're not even aware of it. That's really interesting. I mean, I suppose if you assume the exact same rate of growth that we have now and no loss of that heat to outer space, which I'm not sure about that assumption. I mean, oh, no, it, gets, it gets lost to outer space, just that the equilibrium level is 100 degrees Celsius for the surface of the planet. Yeah, I understand, but in, in biological systems, growth is generally something that plateaus, right? In, bio, in say, yeah. bacterial biofilms and so forth. At some point, and I, I really feel like we're starting to see that a little bit, at least in the developed world. Like, we're definitely at the knee of the logarithmic growth. And so it's oh, actually we're, really, it, really it, interesting, because in bacterial systems, I think that it's the buildup of waste that generates the knee to the logarithmic growth because you have all these things that feed back on the genetics of the bacteria. And so they're in they're oh. in linear growth and they're doubling every 20 minutes or something for if you're using E. coli. And then they mm. get to the point where they start to hit what's called stationary phase. And stationary phase is where you have a buildup of waste products, but there's also a lot of nutrients around because as as oh. bacteria die in lice, they release their stuff into the environment. And so you enter into this uncomfortable balance. It stays in the balance for some period of time. And then unless there's some kind of significant shift to the cultural conditions, it'll crash down to zero. Yeah. With yeah. only a few persister cells, which is like a whole nother branch of, of biology, which is perhaps not wouldn't, relevant wouldn't doubling be exponential? It's it's linear on a logarithmic scale. Uh, uh, Sorry. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's uh that that is that is true, yeah. But basically it's uh that we're probably in the stationary phase. We're or entering into the stationary phase. And I think we've overshot it. Or we've overshot it. And that's what we're not aware of. That we definitely overshot the capacity Maybe. we can have on this planet. Maybe, but I'm like I'm lo I'm literally I'm looking at the new generation and I am nuts. I I am predicting a fertility rate of one. Not a lot of breeders. I'm just I'm predicting a fertility rate of one for this next generation. For the whatever the youngest one is that's that's being born which is not replacement rate. No, that's have that's having. Like I think that the population of this next generation is going to have over the course of its reproductive years. Accepting immigration as well. 
accepting immigration. Like I, I'm, I of the people that are born in, let's say, the United States today, as I think that it's a combination of chemical contamination. I think it's a combination of cultural media contamination. I think it's a question of uh, density. Like, do you know the guy who did all those Rat Park studies? Or not Rat Park, Rat Utopia studies. His name is James Calhoun. One of my friends, uh, Tim Gooding, is a great fan of that study. So he told me it in detail. And every last like, ideal situation and every time the civilization collapses. Well, so I think that it's important to note that Calhoun set it up in such a way to accelerate the collapse, right? Because oh, okay. he uh, he figured out that there were these things called behavioral sinks. And so he would, and these are areas where the rats gather in vast numbers and the act of gathering further perpetuates the depraved breakdown of rat society. And so he would create mm. behavioral sinks where he would force them to crowd together and then to accelerate the breakdown. And he never, oh, right. he, like, he didn't clean the cages. He didn't take, he didn't do a lot to make sure that they were growing super, super dense in an area that was still clean. And so you can look at that and question what it does. But most people have dismissed Calhoun's studies because he was a little bit of a lunatic. Like he got okay. really, he got really uh, like revelations biblical towards the end because he thought that his mm. work was basically shining a light on how human society was going to fall apart. And he started to get really serious about it. And that gave everybody the license to dismiss him outright. But I think that that stuff is happening. I think that people growing up in, in super dense metropolitan areas. It's, There's certainly a touch of this, you know, I don't, the whole gender thing. You know, I'm not, I'm not an anti-woke person by any means, but the whole gender identification and um, what, what are the group that don't have sex? I forgot they call themselves the, um, the uh, he saw this in his rat experiments too, right? NBs and uh, aren't they NBs? No, NBs are something else. Something else. We'll, we'll think of it at some point. But yeah, but there are some of those weird developments, um, which may just be by the sheer pressure and neuroticism that generates in crowded and and lone, crowded and lonely places, and that's a large part of a civilization is you know is crowded and lonely. Yes, so NB is for people that are non-binary. I don't know what the one for asexual is. There's demisexuals. There's a lot of them. Mm. The point is, is that this is proliferating widely. And to me, it seems like there's going to be a pretty serious inflection curve in population density and population growth that we also can't really forecast because it's almost impossible to tell. And we don't have a good picture of the chemical contamination that is affecting it. Like, I don't know if you know Shauna Swan's work, but she's been looking at how levels of testosterone have drawn but dropped by like 40% or more over the course of the last 20 years. Pretty huge. I, know, I, know, I don't know the research, but I do know the research. And yeah, it seems, it seems quite you know, incontrovertible. We're getting less fertile, less interested in sex. Um, and and that, you know, that a huge part of physical contaminants can be a large factor behind that. But also, I think also the stress of our societies too. It's an incredibly stressful life we lead these days. Even you know, even the ord most ordinary life. You know, you, people are working in zero contract hours and gig economy, and uh, and and the sort of social dislocation that comes out of that. Yeah, uh, you know, sex. You'd think we're having more sex because we can transmit it and have images of it and so on. And and we've broken down the social taboos dramatically. We're destroying our physical capacity to have an interest in it at the same time. And so I wonder how all of this gets folded into an economic model, right? Because it's not just energy. It's not just people doing stuff. It's also the way that the environment feeds back onto the people. And so one of the solutions that uh, you hear bandied about a lot is, okay, well, let's leave 70% of the planet for nature and we move people into progressively denser and denser metropolitan areas so that they have less of an impact on the rest of the world. And intuitively, I like that. I like the idea that you could go out and there would be wilderness and the animals would be free to live. But on the other hand, I wonder what happens when you get people into such dense environments socially? What happens to them psychologically? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we've got far too many people. I, I don't think 
the problem is only population, but it certainly is one of our problems. Too many, too many humans, um, and and far too few other animals. So if we're going to do that balancing and say, you know, fifty or seventy percent belongs to what the wild environment and humans are not allowed into those regions, then we're down to thirty percent of the planet, thirty percent of the land area, obviously. Um, and that would mean a far lower population than we have right now. And, you know, humans got on, we had some pretty interesting civilizations when the total population of the planet was less than 200 million. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what the population, I don't know the numbers all that well. Ang Angus Madison used to maintain those numbers about the scale of human civilization, but I've got a feeling up toward probably the 1800s or 1700s, we didn't have more than 200 million people. And yet we have, you know, everybody knows Roman history. Some people know Chinese history, Indian history. There's an enormous amount of complexity to the civilizations. Some of the people we still respect enormously, Shakespeare, Cicero, uh, Caesar, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, tiny populations compared to what we have. We don't need 8 billion of us, um, but that's what we've got ourselves into that dilemma. There was more Black Death, though. Well, that was what the 1300s. That that knocked off about I think 30 percent of the population. Yeah, but yeah. there was also more war. There was more starvation. Like I think that when I think people it was regular plagues that took out like 25 percent of the population. Wars too, right? Regularly, yeah. tens of thousands of young men. Yeah, and so you get into a place that's really creepy because if you're like, okay, too many people in the world, which you can make the argument that that's the case, but then the next sentence is we should control it. And I'm like, well, the only way that we know how to control it is by one-child policies, or forcibly sterilizing people, or putting something in the water. Or we start thinking about moving off planet. Let's which, I mean, that. as much... I, I don't have a great deal of time for Jeff Bezos as a person, um, but the idea of moving you know, human civilization into Dyson spheres and, 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 get, and getting away from... Basically, not not doing it so much for our benefit, but doing it for the benefit of the biosphere. We 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 still don't have any other location in the universe that has life, so we should be doing all we can to minimise the damage we do to this planet and let life thrive. And if we can manage to go off planet, then if, once we get off planet and we and if we can generate living structures in which we can breed, we can get an enormous populations, but just not on this planet. My worry with that is that this narrative is driven because the super wealthy would love to have the planet to themselves and that living on Mars is going to be an utter hellscape with, you know, some Philip K. Dick Hovel stations that people are, you Just know. doing their metaverse drugs in. Like, that's going to be the thing, right? It's like the, the soma will be the only thing that makes Mars tolerable. Is that what you're trying to say? Exactly, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, it, 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 well, it, I think people had the same attitude about you know, North America once. Um, though, you know, North America is incredibly bountiful, of course, but, um, you know, we've, we've moved to barren locations on this planet before. Um, and if we did move to somewhere like Earth, or like Mars, uh, we'd be trying to terraform it over time. Have you, have you read the red, red Mars, uh, blue, green Mars, blue Mars series? Kim Stanley Robinson? I haven't. I mean, I, I read yeah. red Mars when I was a kid, but I didn't finish the Yeah, page. yeah. Okay. It, it's interesting. Um, but you know, we would be trying as much as possible to create an interesting environment for ourselves. One element I think of blue Mars was, or green Mars, I think it was, was uh, an art form was creating storms. Hmm. Um, yeah, the, big, so, the biggest hurdle is uh, is the radiation, from what I understand. Like, there's no magnetic field to protect the. Even if you were to yeah. build an atmosphere, there's no way to protect that atmosphere from getting destroyed or people on the surface. Oh, yeah, so you, everybody's going. You, you can't. You can't keep it. That, that's, 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 I mean, the thing is, we, we try ultimately to have a technology that does it. Uh, but that's part of the idea of Dyson spheres or, you know, space habitats where you can actually have machinery that generates the deflective magnetic fields that you need. We're incredibly lucky that Earth uh, was formed by the collision of two planetoids. I mean, I, I, I don't know that deep, deep area all that well, but the arguments are that the core of the Earth is actually the core of two planets. And the energy and the rotation uh, of that is what gives us the magnetic field that enables us to deflect solar radiation, whereas Mars doesn't have anything like that scale. Um, you know, so yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible accidents of history that have given us a, a biosphere that enabled, well, actually a place that had a biosphere, period. Um, so that's, that's remarkable. But 
you know, if, if we really regard ourselves as the intelligent species and we believe that, you know, we can develop technology to cope with any environment ultimately, given enough time, then we should be able to do that. And it'll be an awful period when you start, absolutely. Um, but it'd also be, the, you know, that classic idea, the pioneering spirit would be there. Um, to me, it's feasible. And I think, I, I think we, my, my, a major reason why I, I want the idea to happen is I think we're going to destroy civilization on this planet. We're likely to get, in reaction to this climate breakdown we're going to see, we're likely to get a religious uh, explosion where people uh, become anti-technology. Mm -hmm. And to maintain our technology, I think we need a civilization off planet because if you're off planet, you have to have technology. But if we if we have a you know a, an apocalyptic breakdown and people look back and see this period, they would literally call an apocalypse if there's enough of them around to call it that. Uh, that is likely to be a highly anti-technological society and to blame technology for the state of the world that they find themselves being raised in. Well, it's interesting because it's technology versus social media on some level. Because I don't uh, think that it's because I, I really think that people like their cars. They like being able to fly places. They like oh yeah, energy is fabulous. I mean, I, I want I want to buy a Tesla um, Roadster when it comes out. I definitely want to get the the Cybertruck. You know, um, <laughs> and the, I, I still know when I hop on a plane and take off, I enjoy the feeling of being accelerated. Uh, that's why we have amusement parks and to get spun around and thrown and. You know, the, the, if you've seen, uh, it, again, Twitter's fabulous for this. Uh, there's a video of a, of a little baby elephant going for a mudslide. I haven't you know? seen that one. Okay. So it, it isn't just us. There's a real thrill to acceleration. I like we that just your feed to be is basically just animals having fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we are. <laughs> and and, and like, that's why we hit the drugs as well. But, you know, I, 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 there's one video I've seen of a border colleague, I think it is, who's got himself a, a, uh, in a snow environment, he's got a, a boogie board and he's riding the boogie board down and then runs up the hill and rides the boogie board down again. So we all enjoy the feeling of acceleration and speed. We just happen to be faster than any other animal. So I, it, it, it's not something I denigrate. So we just didn't realise the consequences for the whole biosphere. So if we want to continue doing it, we've got to go off this planet. And we are getting to the point where our technology would enable us to do that. And I think we really, I think we have to do it to be able to maintain a technological civilization because we're going to fuck the planet. And the people looking back and they say it's all technology's fault. We'll have a religion based around the uh, rejection of technology on this planet. It's easy to imagine some sort of speciation event where people, some group of people take on all these biotechnologies and get these neural implants and artificial organs and all of this. And some group of, of people, whether it's religiously motivated or not, decide to stay as, you know, naturalists or something. And you have really two types of people all of a sudden. So I... You've got elements there now, you know, with the, with the, uh, the Amish. Hmm. And they're having a lot of babies. Yeah, well, that, <laughs> that, you know, breeding is a pretty interesting activity if you're Amish. Um, but, but yeah, they, they've got that strong culture, that, that sense of identification. And they eschew technology, not completely, but they eschew it very largely compared to what we do. So, yeah, there's, there's potential for an enormous range of different civilizations. I mean, one of the worries, you guys know much more about biology than I do, but I have seen comments that if we did live in the very narrow range of diversity of human DNA, we've likely got problems in continuing to be able to reproduce, even without the chemical damage we're doing, for anything like another million years. Um, so we're going to have to get technology that enables us to diversify our DNA to stop us hitting a dead end where we can no longer reproduce. Maybe the aliens can help us with that. <laughs> I just think that we're on the verge of starting muck to muck about in the sequences of our genomes because that's what a lot of the technology medically is pointing towards. So CRISPR-Cas mm. is our most breakthrough technology they got a, the nobel prize in medicine for it a couple of years ago dude none yeah. the lady from france but uh that is basically a stepping stone to significantly modifying the human genome yeah it is and like we, we i mean the thing is we we i remember the days when people thought there was a gene for this and a gene for that the very linear idea about genes and now we really, the behemoths have so many genes because we're so much more complicated than an earthworm. And then we find the earthworm's got 100,000 genes and so have we. 
<laughs> and they say, oh, well, it can't be the number. It must be how they interact with each other. And now we get interactions of proteins with it. You know, the, so the, 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 it's an incredibly chaotic nonlinear system, and we're only scratching the surface of it. And the dangers are, of course, that we will try it, we'll fuck up parts that we don't even realise are interrelated to each other. But I think ultimately, yeah, we're going to have to do something like that and learn about it because otherwise, as a species, we may well be cease to be able to reproduce. Is there a field of bioeconomics? Um, there's biophysical economics, as we call it, and that's like Charlie Hall was the person who first invented that term. And that's people like myself are saying we have to have an economics which recognises our dependence upon the biosphere. So biophysical, the, the reason for saying it is we are biological creatures and we rely upon the physical environment to be able to have an economy in the first place. And by not acknowledging that, that's partly why we're destroying it. Hmm. What are you going to say? I mean, I, I mentioned the aliens a little bit earlier. Have you been following all this alien stuff that's going oh, on? Oh, not really. I mean, um, is there I, an I, economic I, basis for for all of this disclosure stuff? I, I, I you know, like I, I love watching Star Trek, um, and um, I, I love the thought of aliens and so on. And part of me thinks, well, there's such a vast universe, there has to be other civilizations in it. But another part looks at the way in which life came about on this planet and like for we've got 4.5 billion years or 4.3 billion years old and within a couple of hundred mil million years there were uh, single cellular life forms but it wasn't until about what 600 million years ago we got multicellular and that appears to involve the period of snowball earth as part of why we multicellular life became feasible and then a long time after that before we had uh, animals with spines and the whole Cambrian period. Now we're realizing it's a period before the Cambrian. And then we turn up and we're talking about 700,000 to a million years ago. And that's when we had the first sign of conscious intelligence. Plenty of intelligence beforehand, but intelligence that realized it, it, it had a self. Uh, and, it could, and you could see a reflection and say, oh, that's me. Um, that's only happened in the last million years of 4.3 billion. So that makes me think, well, maybe we are the only intelligent civilization in the galaxy. I don't think we're the only intelligent civilization in the universe. The universe is just too vast. But there's a possibility we're the only intelligent species in the Milky Way. And if we fuck up, that's the end of intelligence. And one thing, I, I think it's Brian May who made this point, and, uh, that humans' role is to be the observers of the universe, to understand. Humans' role is to understand. And if we end up destroying ourselves, we destroy understanding. And I think the, the thing which I think the most valuable thing we've done in the last quarter of a mil, quarter of a thousand years, the last you know, quarter millennium, is the knowledge we've accumulated. It's so vast, it's so incredible, and that's what I'm afraid of losing. And that's one reason why I think I, I want to see us get a civilization off planet because I think what's going to happen here, courtesy of the breakdown of the biosphere by the scale of pressure our industrial civilization has put upon it we're going to come anti-technology and anti-knowledge and so the only chance i think we really have to maintain knowledge indefinitely is to have a branch of us that goes off planet and then they have to be technological because there's no chance of survival without a highly technological civilization off planet i do think that it is not an accident that the modern conception of science correlates pretty tightly to a period of prosperity material oh yeah prosperity. It's, it's vital you've, you've got to have material you know people like even newton uh you know uh, he did a lot of he, he wrote principia mathematica during a plague that was back with the classic you know being stuck back at home routine but he had to have the time and the food at the same time to do it you know rather than being forced to go in the fields and and uh, and dig up you know, root crops to stay alive. So you have to have some degree of physical surplus and physical prosperity to enable you to think in the detail to which we do to invent abstract concepts like calculus. So prosperity is vital, but um, you know we now reward people for being Ponzi schemers to get that prosperity, not for being scientists and engineers. And I think we really and artists, and we we have to reflect the. We have to reward the creative side of humanity rather than the exploitive side. And in 
terms of money, the way that the only way that you can use money to reward someone is by generating it somewhere, right? So you have to have some kind of tax base or you have to have revenue of some sort that you can distribute to the people that are doing the work that you find valuable. And we live inside of a system where people don't like to do that because it's seen as a handout and there's all these social Darwinist perspectives that we have about the fact that the entrepreneurial deserve to be wealthy and the starving artist deserves to be the starving artist. And so in a parallel economy, what does it look like? Do you do you just give vouchers to people who are artists so that they can participate in the world? Or how do you how do you bring that how this, do you change the value this, system? This is a discussion that's actually taking part in place in non-mainstream economics right now between what they call a job guarantee and a universal basic income. And the group is called modern monetary theorists who have a proper understanding of how the government creates money. I've developed the understanding how the private sector creates money, along with a guy called Richard Werner and a few others, Michael Hudson being one of them. Um, Can you but, get Richard Werner uh, to respond to our emails? Oh, has he, have you written to him? And we, we have twice and he won't respond. Oh, I don't know. I actually bumped into him two weeks ago, so I might just drop him an email and put a plug in for you. But he's, he's not, not the easiest person to get to know, unlike Michael, for example. So I can't, I can't be sure, but I'll give it a try. That's out but of yeah. Um, yeah, but like you've got the, the modern monetary theory crowd are very strong in favour of a job guarantee and anti-universal basic income. And my perspective is that the way technology is going, particularly with robotics right now, if that continues for long enough, there will be no need for human labour. And in that case, the only way you can keep the vast majority of the population alive is to say there's a guaranteed minimum we're going to give everybody. If you want to get more than that, you've got to be entrepreneurial and, and so on. A universal basic income thing is absolutely essential. And then with that, you are freed up to do whatever you want to do. Um, and and that, that, I think, is where creativity comes from. And, uh, you know, so you, you wouldn't necessarily be rolling in money, but you would, you would not be starving in a garret either. And we need, we, that's, that's why I'm a, I'm a fan of universal basic income, uh, whereas most people from my side of economics are anti that they want everybody to have to work for a living. I just don't think work is going to be sustained for the next, if we don't, if we don't, don't actually destroy our civilization, then labor as such, I think will cease to exist in the next 50 years. There's a lot of misconceptions about universal basic income. There's been some cool pilot studies about that. You know, I think that the, hu the biggest criticism from its opponents is that it will demotivate people. But what they've actually seen in a lot of these studies is that people use that extra time that they don't have to be, you know, grinding away at the mill to improve their education, to improve their skill set, to actually develop something productive, to start new businesses. Yeah. It's actually quite extraordinary and flies no, in the I agree with that. of the opposition. Yeah. I mean, the opposition basically is a really, really, it's got a very puritanical side to it. You know, you've got to be, you've got to suffer to get paid, you know, and you've got to, therefore, you've got to work. It's something unpleasant to get money. Um, whereas if you, again, you look back to, you know, early pro magnon societies, we get our sense of who we are by our contribution and how it's recognized by the society we're part of. Absolutely. So in that sense, the university income says, there you go, everybody's got enough to stay alive and uh, how are you going to entertain us? You know, what are you going to do that's going to make us laugh? And, and therefore what you get is more creativity, not less. Uh, I've seen people say, you know, it's not, a, it's not income to do nothing, income to do anything. Hmm. I guess the other oppositional argument is who's going to pay for that? You know, is it going to deflate the currency, things like that? Well, it comes back to the physical production levels. It, it, money is, you know, little pieces of green paper, fundamentally. Uh, there's no problem with creating little pieces of green paper. The hard part is creating enough physical resources and distributing it in such a fashion that people, everybody gets to stay alive and live moderately comfortably. Um, so it's really the physical resources that matter. Uh, and if you if you have a if you had a system of robots powered by nuclear energy, uh, where you restrain restricted the damage we do to the biosphere in the process, then those robots could be producing enough stuff for those us living beings to have enough to survive on. Uh, and how many pieces of paper are involved in uh, in in redistributing uh, the labor of the the, the labor? That, what do you, what would you call it for robots? The ro the robotics. Sure. Uh, that's. That's the problem. That's not you know, the, the monetary system. <laughs> it isn't the absence of money. It's how you design your monetary system. 
to enable the production to occur and the distribution to be feasible. It seems like we're verging on a perpetual motion machine in economics if we start to produce machines that are able to produce money. Well, that's, you know, the idea of a von Neumann machine. I don't know. Can you, uh, can von, you elaborate? I don't know. Okay. Von Neumann, okay, one of the world's great geniuses, um, spoke about it. So the, if you wanted to colonize the universe, what you need is a machine that can both produce other machines and produce itself. So once they have a machine that can make itself as well as making other machines, you can basically send them out and they'll colonize the, 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 the entire uh, galaxy quite feasibly. So it, it's a case of if robotics gets more sophisticated, then ultimately what you're doing, if you, you, if you think about a von Neumann machine, you can actually regard parts of the planet as a von Neumann machine to say how much land area, how many different resources, how many forms of technology do you need to the stage at which that particular region of the planet can reproduce itself without needing anything from anywhere else. Now, I reckon we've probably got about 10 von Neumann machines on the planet. If you broke it down into 10, or even maybe 30 or 40, 50, 60, 80, you know, 100 million people, groups of eight, 80 groups of 100 million people would be in its own way self-sustaining. Uh, so the idea of a von Neumann machine is to reduce that scale to it's like you know, one single machine that can reproduce itself and make anything else it wants, it needs. And if you then put it through the, you know, loose in the asteroid belt, then you've got a self-reproducing capability. Um, this is all, you know, fantasy stuff as we're talking right now. But so was you know, jet travel. And it was, was a fantasy 200 years ago. Now it's a commonplace. So, you know, I have a, there's part of me which is the techno-optimist and says, if we survive what we're doing to ourselves right now, then really the sky is the limit. Um, but we've, what we've got to do is to make sure we don't destroy both ourselves, the biosphere, and our willingness to in, to innovate technologically. If if the if it's possible to save the human species by moving off planet, is it possible to also save the biosphere by moving it off planet? Because you talked about Dyson spheres, but also there's the O'Neill cylinders. There's all of this super yeah, techno futurist yeah, yeah. optimism. I mean, the, the problem there is, and, and you, know, you mentioned this a short while ago, it's the scale of it, we just don't know what is necessary in terms of biodiversity to enable life to exist. So we could actually have a you know O'Neill sphere and find we didn't put a particular bacteria in there, a particular enzyme, and bang, the whole thing fails. Um, so it's going to be a, a horrific period of, ex of experimentation. For a while, if we do that, we'd have to have you know, transport going from Earth to these spheres all the time to say, what seems not to be working? What, what do you seem to be missing so we can supply it with you over time? So Earth would be the mothership uh, mm -hmm. as, as we went through that process. But I think, again, I, I can contemplate that it's feasible. Yeah, I can I, imagine. Yeah, and I can imagine more experimentation like that that would be really productive and, and informative. There was the, do you know, the Biosphere Two experiments, where uh, yeah, how's it? How, how's it? How, I knew, I knew what was happening. Is it still happening? No, it it was it was a series of disasters. Um, well, it happened a while ago. The Biosphere Two was in the yeah, I want to say it was in the eighties. I think there's a new one happening as well. I though, think there might be understand. Biosphere Three. Hold on, I'll look at really? it. Yeah, okay. that's what I think. Yeah, yeah. But I know they learned a lot from t from the two experiments, and in particular, they did have a technical uh, snaggle where the CO two scrubbers, I think, stopped working. They had some problem with uh -huh. people getting hypoxia, and they didn't yeah. quite realize it was happening, and it was very tricky. Uh, it, all sorts of social ailments resulted from that. People started getting cranky with one another hoarding food, stealing oh, from each yeah, other, like a, you know, the whole gamut, right? There's, and, there's a guy that I know who I've, I've had a falling out with uh, who did his PhD on a community living in Antarctica. And frankly, I couldn't imagine anybody less appropriate for being in a small community like that. He's an incredibly difficult individual himself. <laughs> oh, no. And he had his PhD in this bloody study. So, yeah, the, the, that, that is a real issue. How do you get a community which actually generally speaking, likes each other. I think that might be the hardest part in a way, and making yeah. sure everybody has... I, I, I think the biosphere is the hardest. I, I think biodiversity is the hardest part, but that'll be number two. So I, I looked it up, and they did do another biosphere experiment, but it was only for six days. 
Oh, that's would, all. Only six days. Yeah. I mean, ridiculous. did you know that Steve Bannon had a financial stake in the Biosphere Project? I had a very, yeah, I knew there was some sort of weird connection there. I, I've always wanted to explore more about that. Didn't it get bought up by Columbia University at the end? Too? At some point, Lamont owned it, but then I think Steve, I don't, I don't know exactly the financial history of it. But I think that these sorts mm -hmm. of projects just go to show how difficult it is to be able to run a closed circuit ecosystem we do not understand yeah, mm -hmm. ecology and we do not understand how the world works we don't understand where life comes from i think we don't actually understand what life is i think that these really fundamental philosophical questions are still left out in the open and so when we talk about colonizing space that's probably going to be the time that we figure it out we start digging inside of mars and we start to realize that whoa life seems to be coming from inside the planet that's going to be a very different perspective on the cosmos than we have right now or if yeah. we start to realize that, you know, the the human body has 30 times more bacterial cells in it than it has human cells. Yeah, we're, we're a cooperative and don't realize it. Yeah. Right? And 30 so times. It's They used to think it was 100 times and they downgraded it to 30 recently. I've seen low estimates yeah. of like one to one. Too. What? Yeah, sorry. I don't know. These are things people split hairs about. It's like, what do you include? And there's the skin flora, the gut flora. Check it out. Well, even mitochondria, you know, mitochondria or even DNA may have been a combination of a, you know, a pre, or well, the eukaryotic cell and uh, and RNA. There's all sorts of ways in which symbiosis has been a part of the formation of complex life, and we just we have an incredibly simplistic understanding of that right now, and we can't we can't have that simplistic understanding in outer space. We have, in fact, been downgraded to one to one. <laughs> How depressing! But even if it's one to one, it's you know I'm still going to make the point. Huge, right? sure. Yeah, <laughs> it's right? huge. Yeah, it's, if you just look at what an what an organism is, it's really a collective of different cells that all have their wants and needs, but somehow found that that sharing those wants and needs worked out for them in the bet for the better. And that's what I mean when I asked earlier, where I was asking if there was a field of bioeconomics because biophysics yeah. and a the thermodynamic mathematical modeling is different from the kind of nutrient exchange waste flows recycling of materials that goes on inside of a living organism yeah it, it, I think there's no way economists are going to produce that themselves because they've got far too simplistic a model of the economy itself let alone the biosphere so I'd rather I think you're going to get that of biologists and engineers and geneticists long before economists wake up to it. So it'd be very useful to do, definitely. But, you know, the economists are too damn stupid to even imagine they could work it out. Are there interdisciplinary programs where economists are working with people like geophysicists and astrophysicists and microbiologists to start? Because really. I find I mean, it impossible to believe that the rules of economics are somehow unique in all of nature, these must be foundational rules of limitations and supply that every single system runs up against, whether it's geothermal or biological. Yeah, yeah but economists, the, 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 the neoclassical economics is far too primitive to even be able to comprehend that concept. So if, if, if we didn't have neoclassical economics, we had biophysical economics, then you would have a potential collaboration between those economists and, and biologists and geneticists to be able to work it out. But it, it just, it, it's an incredibly primitive discipline. It's a pre-scientific discipline. I, I regard it as, uh, it's, it's, it's great book is Marshall rather than the great book being Aristotle, it's Alfred Marshall. Everything goes back to Alfred Marshall with a, what looked like a neat and plausible model, which was wrong. And that's what they built their whole understanding on. So economists are not going to develop that. It's going to have to be other disciplines that do it. Is there any will towards that? Like, are there institutions that are trying to have that come together? Because I feel like, uh, I think it's, what is it? Kate Raworth has her donut economics, which I think is kind yeah. of starting to push in that direction. But it's still yeah, very but, large yeah. scale. Uh, it's very holistic. Yeah. And it doesn't have a lot of you know, internal mathematical and uh, logical detail to it. too. So Kate's doing probably the best work in setting up the framework. But it's a long way from that actually being like an analytic system uh, to ex to explain. It's it's conceptual. It's not analytic. Do you think that a, a successful th economic theory has to be analytically predictive? 
Like, do you have to be able to punch stuff into it and then get the numbers out? Because that's your your big complaint about the climate stuff, which is that economists aren't correctly predicting the impact of changes to the economy downstream. Oh, they're making up they're making up their own numbers. That's the problem. They right. made up their own data. Okay. And they, they they made up data to prove their their assumption that the climate change doesn't matter. And that's that's why we're so dangerous with them. But I, I think like any to be a science, you've got to have an analytic foundation, analytic capability. And economists have tried to ape what physics did, but have done it extremely badly. So if you we did actually have a you know an understanding of that that you know, biogenetic analysis, you'd have to have concepts about you know chemical exchanges or energy exchanges, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's got to be a model there. The economists have got entirely the wrong model. We can start asking the question, let alone provide the answers. But do you have optimism that it's possible to produce a model that is analytically predictive and robust? Or do I do, think- but okay. it, 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 that's when, partly what I'm working on um, myself, trying to show you can derive macroeconomics from macroeconomics and then building. That's why I built Minsky as a system dynamics program to be able to try to ultimately integrate all these ideas but even that you know it, it, it's still got a you know fundamentally a single dimensional view of the the economy which is insufficient so uh, it, it we're a long way from being able to model uh an economy in the way we can model a circuit board um so i because i wonder if we, we, we can yeah oh, go ahead no go ahead go ahead so we, 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 we could get there but we're starting from the wrong place so explain to me what you mean by deriving macroeconomics from macroeconomics. Well, this is quite simple as it happens. Like neoclassicals are obsessed with building macroeconomics from microeconomics. So they think you've got to, to do macroeconomic modeling, you've got to derive it from microeconomic foundations. And that's a bit like saying biology is actually applied chemistry. So a biology exam, the first question of biology exam was which chemicals do you need to combine and what ratios to create life? And that's obviously absurd okay but economists are thinking the same way they've got to do macro by driving it from micro and if you know the, that brilliant paper by pw anderson more is different uh, you don't know it as well well worth taking a look at i think in 1972 was, was the date of it um but he argued that any each new level of analysis uh is its own field you if biology is not applied chemistry Biology involved concepts that you simply cannot drive out of a chemistry because of emergent properties of a complex system. So the same thing applies in economics. So I can take a defi- I can take three definitions, uh, like the the wages share of GDP, which is wages divided by GDP, the employment ratio, which is the number of people with a job divided by population, and the private debt ratio, which is how much people the, the level of private debt divided by GDP turn those into dynamic definitions and then put in very simple assumptions. And I generate a model that gives us a financial instability. The, the Minsky's financial instability hypothesis pops right out of those three definitions. So you get a cyclical, non-equilibrium, monetary dominated model out of three definitions. It's ridiculous how simple it is. Um, so it, it is possible. And what you're doing is saying the economy's behavior determined by its structure. Which is similar in some ways to what you do when you're when doing biology. The cell's behavior is determined by its structure and its internal dynamics. So economists are still trying to do the impossible. They derive biology from chemistry, um, and they're doing it with lousy definition of chemistry. They're using it for the just on definition of of heat. Okay, so they're just they're a useless bunch. And the trouble is they're a useless, arrogant bunch and they think they know everything. And therefore, they've ta- that's why they dive into climate change and thought they could answer the questions without even knowing what the answer, what the questions were in the first place. So, And yeah. so to derive macroeconomics from macroeconomic principles, what would that look like? What that looks like, they, they believe they have a model of a, a individual behavior called a utility maximizing individual. So you're supposed to be somebody who is simply trying to get more subjective satisfaction and you have a set of preferences, uh, which you then combine with your budget, and you rationally decide the best possible way to allocate your budget in order to maximize your subjective utility. And then they think you've got to use that and aggregate that to go from an individual demand curve to a market demand curve to aggregate demand in the economy. 
And then on the other side, they've got profit maximizing firms. They think the same thing. A profit maximizing firm is going to have to equate declining revenue because if it sells an extra unit, it suffers a fall in price. So it's what's called marginal revenue is less than its price. And then it's got a rising marginal cost because it, if you get less productivity out of each new input you put into a production system. All of that is bullshit. That's whatever they believe. That's what in all the textbooks. But when you look at the, 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 uh, the micro, they can't even derive a market demand curve from an idea of an individual demand curve. That's called the sonnenschein mantel de Broer theorem. They simply can't do it. It's mathematically impossible. What they then they assume, and you're going to love this, Paul Samuelson, who's the guy who gave us this theory in the first place of utility maximizing individuals, assumed that there's a benevolent dictator who redistributes income prior to exchange, so everybody's, everybody's happy about the distribution of income. That's his model of America. Okay, now I was, all I want to know is what fucking drugs was he on when he came up with that stupid idea? Because I've <laughs> never been that stoned in my life. Okay? Uh, and then you look, at, you look at the idea of diminishing marginal productivity. That assumes factories are designed by idiots rather than designed by engineers. Uh, so the idea is you get people bumping into each other and falling over machines. It's a sort of keystone cops vision of how factories operate. When you look at a real factory, it's designed by a bunch of engineers. They design it so it gets maximum efficiency at 100% utilisation. You all think you're going to have more than your current share of the market. So you all have excess capacity. With that excess capacity, you never get the diminishing marginal productivity that's an essential part of the neoclassical theory in the first place. So I've just done the mathematics on why in that world, rather than trying to maximise profits by equating marginal cost and marginal revenue, you maximise profits by flogging as many units as you possibly can, which is what you find happens in the real world anyway. So they've got this forlorn, impossible endeavour of producing a complex system out of its component parts, which Anderson calls constructionism, which is not reductionism. It's the opposite of reductionism. Um, and there's, they're doing, they've got that wrong in the first place. They've got a stupid micro about the individual behaviour. Uh, they've got a stupid micro about uh, firm production. And out of that, they're trying to produce some macroeconomics. That's no damn wonder they didn't see the financial crisis coming. There's been a lot of talk of another financial crisis coming because of inflation and because of overwhelming debts, because the the... Treasury is printing so much money. Do you think that there's something that's coming that people have again missed in these classical neoclassical theories? Not really. No, this time around. I mean, for a start, that's one reason I built Minsky as a software package to explain how money is created. And the government government debt is not debt. Yeah. Government debt is a record of how much money the government's created by fiat. So we talk about fiat, and what fiat means as a word is I command the following. And a, a government commands money into existence by spending more than it gets back in taxation. And it would be quite possible for the Treasury to spend more than it gets back in taxation and then to sell bonds that cover the gap to the central bank. Okay. All this stuff we call government debt, 100% of it could be bought by the, Federal, by the Federal Reserve tomorrow. Absolutely nothing stopping that happening. Okay. So the whole idea that the government's in debt I mean, literally tomorrow, if I was a Federal Reserve president, I could say, let's go, let's buy all the government bonds, every last one of them. So you wouldn't even get anything appearing as debt in the private sector. So what we call government debt is not debt, it's bonds. The, the bonds, government sells bonds equivalent to the difference between its spending and its taxation. Uh, it's very, very different. You're going to a bank. If you, you, if you want to buy a house, you can't issue bonds. Okay. Okay. You, you can't say, so I'm going to buy that house. Here's, the, here's a billion dollars worth of bonds I've created. Give me the house. They'll give you a kick in the backside instead. So you've got to go to a bank and borrow money off the bank. Okay. So bank money creation is by lending out more than they get back in, back in repayments. Um, and I've, all that mechanics is easily to model in Minsky. That's, that's why I've learned this. By building Minsky, I've learned how the monetary system works. So... Um, We've got all these fallacies about government debt to start with. It's really private debt that's a problem. One man you should have on about this, by the way, is a guy called Richard Vague. Richard has done by far the best work on um, on what is called financial crises in the last 200 years. He's got a brilliant book called A Brief History of, of Doom and a new one, and I'm trying to think of its name. I've, I've read it just recently. Um, 
but I, I can't recall the name straight away. Uh, but he'd be excellent to explain those actual mechanics to you. Um, so I, we, we, we still have far too much private debt. We didn't get rid of the private debt we accumulated during the global financial crisis. Um, but that could be eliminated by the government if it wanted to, if it knew that it could do it very easily. Um, uh, so we have an overhang, too much debt. Uh, China could have a, a few problems that way. Richard's analysis points out that France will have problems, uh, if, if, a few other elements of that nature. But nothing like the global financial crisis on the scale that it was back then. Um, the real thing, I think, is we're, we're going to have a, a, a collapse in financial values when global warming starts to destroy our productive capabilities and we realise just how damaging it is. That's the danger. I think the next financial crisis is going to be realising uh, that what Carbon Tracker calls stranded assets dominated. We have mines we should not anymore use. We certainly shouldn't let people make a profit out of those mines. So that's what I think is going to be the crisis next time around, uh, ecologically caused, not caused by the private financial system. Hmm. That's very interesting. I mean, I think that that's we we might be able to put a pin in it here. Do you think that there's something that we haven't that we haven't covered that you really wanted to get to? I want to just quickly talk about uh, what economists got wrong on climate change. We've got to finish on that, but that's probably the most important thing facing humanity. Sure. And that is, first of all, they trash the limits to growth. And the limits to growth, people think it's done by a bunch of hippies. It was done by a bunch of engineers at MIT. And it used system dynamics to talk about the feedback effects that, you know, uh, the things like growing population means growing need for food, uh, but it also means you're using more land for non-food uh, uh, factories and houses. So the growth in population both requires food and damages food cap productive capabilities. And all those feedbacks led them to predict a breakdown in our system if we can maintain business as usual sometime in the mid-21st century, which is where we are now or the early to mid to the 21st century. So first of all, economists trashed that, William Nordhaus being the person who trashed it the most. Then they put their own theories in there, and their own theories are, first of all, the wrong foundation for analysing a system like uh, the biosphere, the, the economy in the biosphere. But the worst thing is they simply assumed that if you were indoors, you weren't going to be affected by climate change. Mm -hmm. You literally wrote, that 87% of the economy occurs in carefully controlled environments that are neg negligibly affected by climate change. Right. That was all of manufacturing, all of mining, crazily enough. He didn't re remember that mines are in some mines are open cut. Uh, all of the hotel, hotel and retail services, all of the finance sector, most of real estate, all of government. It's just nonsense. He's equating, he says a roof can protect you from climate change. He's saying that climate change is the weather. And out of it, economists, there was a survey done in, in 2021 where uh, two, uh, two, uh, survey, a survey company surveyed everybody who'd published an article on climate change in the top 25 economic journals. 2,216 people, I think it was. 738 responded. 360 of them answered a question about what's the impact of a trajectory of temperatures towards seven degrees of warming two centuries hence. And they said the impact of that will well, reduce GDP by 20% compared to what it would have been in the complete absence of climate change, which means that rather than the GDP in two centuries hence being 21 times what it is now, it'd be 17 times what it is now. They have no fucking idea. If we head towards seven degrees, we're going to destroy most, mo mo you know, most vertebrates aren't going to survive that. Okay? We're going to wipe out um, mammals quite possibly at seven degrees of warming that's how little they know about climate change and yet they're the ones that politicians turn to and journalists take seriously most of them and that's why we've <clears throat> trembled on for the last 50 years trebling or quadrupling our load on the planet without realizing the dangers of doing it so what carbon trackers report has done is saying that because of the work is so very very bad when you read the papers the referee papers by economists on climate change if the empirical assumptions the economists have made in those papers had been refereed by real scientists, not a single one of the papers would have been published. Not one. But instead, this garbage got the imprimatur of refereed work, the sort of thing Bjorn Lomborg bullshits on about all the time. 
And consequently, we've thought climate change of four degrees, which is, the, again, this is what the IPCC report economic section says, four degrees of warming by 2100 will reduce GDP by between 10 and 23% compared to what would have been in the complete absence of climate change. So that's nonsense. That's the level that scientists think, you know, it's a species, it's a species extinction event, potentially. And economists think it's going to reduce GDP, meaning the GDP rather than being five times what it is now in 2100 will only be four times, which is trivial. So they have probably set up the collapse of capitalism by trying to prevent controls being put on capitalism out of the ideas of the limits to growth. They've encouraged us to grow to the stage where we're going to destroy capitalism by its impact on the biosphere. And do you think that by necessity, just something grows out of capitalism or is it just this boom and bust cycle mm -hmm. where you go from growth to peak to failure to growth to peak to failure just for the rest of time? Well, I mean, I you think have we, to have uh, a better uh, system, uh, right? You, you have to have a system that restrains our, uh, our proclivity to exploit free energy. That's really what's going on here. Um, so you get this enormous profit out of digging a hole in the ground and having oil come out of it. Uh, we, we have to stop that happening. And that's why we just spoke earlier about the idea of a multidimensional monetary system to try to stop that unidimensional uni behavior occurring. Um, but yeah, it's, it, 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 I think Einstein said he didn't know what the th weapons would be used in the Third World War. I'm oh, sorry, he knew the Third World War would use nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, no, what did he say? He said, he doesn't know what weapons we use in the Third World War, but the Fourth World War will use sticks and stones. And my problem is if we actually do the level of destruction that I think is quite feasible with climate change on our sedentary civilizations, then after that, we'll go back to hunters and gatherers and there won't be very many of us hunting and gathering. And that's a dire risk for any civilization because after a civilization falls and a system stops working, that's basically what for all of history has happened and so yeah i i think that shyla said something really apt earlier which is that climate change and global warming tends to be a topic that really fractures people on one side people are saying it's not caused by humans on the other side people are saying that it is caused by humans on one hand you have people saying that it's going to get hotter then you have the global cooling contingent and i don't think that those specifics matter because of what Shiloh said. Every single civilization has fallen because of climate change, and so it doesn't matter what direction you think it's going to go into. It doesn't matter if you think it's humans or not. It's coming, and we ought to be prepared for it because if we're not, sticks and stones is our, is our future. And the, mo the more that we can figure out how to talk about it from that perspective, of just a universal... We, we have to look around and we have to be like, hey... What we have is good enough to protect and to s try to save. And uh, that's I, a, like a middle level of understanding, which uh, we're but, capable of and we haven't developed. But I think that that has to be the level on which we talk about it because we really have to look around and say, you know what, this is worth preserving. And it is Absolutely. worth thinking about yeah. it. And it doesn't matter what direction it goes temperature wise, up, down, it will change. And it is what kills every single civilization. And yeah, if we're just we're doing gonna, it on a global scale. And if and if we are going to get through it, if we're if we we have to find ways to to handle it. And I think that where you're coming at it from, which is trying to include it in a rational way in economic models so that people are actually thinking about consequences in a more robust way, I think is very important. Exactly what I'm trying to do. It's very late. I wish I was doing it 150 years ago. Yeah. Um, Somebody's going to be here in 150 years that will appreciate it. <laughs> That's true. I hope That's so. True. <laughs> They'll be tearing pages out of your book to light the fire over which they cook their rats. <laughs> I'll send you a draft of the book when it's this new one. I think I'll be finishing it in about two months. So if you're ready for a bit of reading, I can send it your way in about two months' time. That'd be fantastic. Okay. Right, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, and I look forward to catching up with you in Austin. That'd be fabulous. So, yeah, um, yeah let's make okay. it happen. Okay, well, I'm gonna. Okay, I'm gonna. My throat's about to fail on me, so I'll I'll, I'll say good night over here. It's eleven. It's five minutes to eleven p.m. over here. All right, sleep well. So, uh, yeah. Okay.
Yeah, so thank you. See you soon. Good night. Okay, bye. Bye, folks. Bye-bye. Bye.